the event is scheduled to run from 8 a.m. until noon, with one 20-minute break starting at 9.40 a.m. and ending at 10. For those that do not know, the women's restroom is located on the far right side of the corridor. The men's restrooms are located on the far left side of the corridor. Um, we also have refreshments available in the atrium. Uh, participants are attending today's session in person, and due to the event being recorded, there will be an asynchronous uh, version for participants to watch after if you're not able to attend. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers ready to connect with you today to include representatives from Disability Support Services, Human Resource Management, Institutional and Curriculum Support, and that's just to name a few. So we'll get started. Our first speaker is here to provide you with a warm welcome and also a few updates. Please welcome Central Texas College's Chancellor, Mr. Jim Yiannopoulos. Things. We've got a lot of uh, 
new new folks on staff, as you know. Uh, your 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 boss is one of them, and uh, he's going to talk to you later today. So I won't take it anywhere from there. But anyway, stay tuned. There's a lot of things coming. We're going to get uh, things uh, looking looking better. I would like to encourage you to help uh, with student activities, uh, student clubs, those those kind of things. We've got to have something for the students to come back to. Uh, you know, just coming to class isn't probably good enough for that. You know, well, you know, I don't really have a connection there. So we need to give them something to have a connection. A lot of schools have sports activities, sports teams, and so forth. We don't have that. So we've got to come up with other things and other ways to do that. But I, I know that you all are very creative. So get, get creative and pass it on, and let's do some things for our students. And that's, that's why we're here. So I will stop with that. Uh, I'll, let me thank, there's many of you in here who are involved at the state level uh, with the Texas uh, Higher Education Coordinating Board. And I want to thank you for the work you're doing. It's not easy, and it, and it is a lot of work, and it's above and beyond everything that we're doing to, to pay you, so you're not getting paid for that. But, but it puts us at the table, it puts us at a seat at the table. And if we're not there, you know, we can't do much to help ourselves, we can't do much to complain. So if you really want to complain, jump in there and uh, get with those other folks. There's Most of those committees consist of anywhere from five to six to seven, eight individuals throughout the state of Texas. So if you're on one of those committees, thank you again. Uh, well done. Some of you are on some national uh, committees. Uh, I'm on you know, some national boards and so forth. But I'm on the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. And so as a trustee, there's 77 of us. There's 11 states that we serve. And uh, then I'm also on the executive committee, so I'm, I'm one, of, one of 11 who are, is the board of trustees for Dr. Whelan. So uh, we get, again, get to sit at the table, we get to, we get to influence the way that goes, and it, and it helps. So again, thank all of you for that, uh, and uh, I hope to see you around. Have, have a good semester, have a good year. Thank you so much. Thank you, Freddie. 
of the very talented leadership team that we have here at CTC. Uh, once a quarter, we go to have our staff meeting off-site. And so Dean Hare picked Panera, it was her turn to pick, and so this is where we had our little uh, Christmas get-together. So I'm not sure how well you can see the artwork, but um, all I can tell you involves a plate above your head, marking above it, spinning it, or putting more things on it, spinning it again, and so anyway, this is what you get uh, when you're creative. And so first place went to Dean Fisher and to Dean Dawson. So great job, Sam, great job. All right, I'm not sure what this is. But anyway, that's my only slide I'm showing to you today. So I want to, I want to take a moment to thank um, you as faculty for what you're doing. Um, we know that obviously you teach, you instruct, um, but you do so much more. You, you grade exams, you write exams, you um, teach online, you teach in the classroom, in SBL, all sorts of ways. Um, and here, in addition to that, you supported so many of our initiatives. Um, first, we had a substantial revision of our academic misconduct policy, and it was led by Ann Anderson. And her proposal included input from department chairs, from deans, from the executive team, um, and she incorporated that feedback. So I think the review was very necessary, and so um, thank you for the input, as I think as it will be fine-tuned over the next year. You piloted BioSite, so we had a number of folks who did and provided feedback, not only to CTC, but also to BioCity. <coughs> and they used that to make sure that the system works well. And so um, many of you faculty had concerns about what do we do with um, students who are taking online courses. We think some of them are cheating. And so um, hopefully BioSite is a great tool that records students as they take exams. And if you have concerns, obviously, um, that should become apparent then. Also, thank you to the department chairs who reviewed the draft of the Academy for Teaching Excellence. This is something that Dean Anderson started and it will continue with um, Dean Fisher uh, for him to work on it. It is a thought as an opportunity for you for um, professional development. Um, and um, so more to come on that, but just know that it is in the works. Also, we have been participating in Texas Guided Pathways for several years now, and Amelia Fairfield and Ellen Falkenstein have been absolutely instrumental um, in, in us being so successful, moving from Calgary, what was it, three to one? We skipped two, we went from three to one. And just to let you know what that involves on the faculty's part, it involves um, doing homework, it involves going to conferences, participating in meetings, gathering information from you, so if these two ladies come to you with information or request information from you, please, please participate uh, because that is something that we are reporting that, that we're using and really we're using it to improve what we do at CTC. Um, our everything from support services to instruction um, and beyond. Uh, this past year, I think, was the year of grants. <laughs> we had an abundance of them in, 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 in all of our areas, I believe. And um, so most recently, we were awarded the True Grant, um, which provides equipment. That's what we've asked for. So Mr. Kirshner, I saw you when I was coming up. Okay. <laughs> so Mr. Kirshner, I think you will be getting a lot of equipment for your industrial technology department. And so that will be um, helping you and, and our students, of course. And also Dean Dawson, in conjunction with Browsport College, applied for a grant, for the consortium grant. <clears throat> and he will be using those funds to provide um, equipment and bring those health programs into the service area, um, in our rural service area, I should say. Uh, thank you also for the department chairs who, who submitted the SWOT analysis. Dean Fisher and I, we sat there earlier, no, was it this week, last week? I don't know, I think last week. We sat there and we went over them, we detected some things, and so what I'm saying is we're hearing you, um, and we will, of course, have subsequent meetings to um, talk about what, what things we could do to, to make it better. Uh, we had some outstanding graduation, thanks to Dr. Garrett and her team and everyone else who supported that. Uh, but we also had graduations that departments put on. I 
see the folks here from um, uh, Criminal Justice and Protective Services. Uh, they put on graduations, health sciences put on graduations. And obviously, that takes a lot of work to organize these, to plan these. And so um, you, you really did a terrific job. And, and moreover, you made it very special for our students. We had a successful SAC COC visit with Dr. Moore. He went to, uh, well, we had the virtual visit, but then we had to have someone come to make sure we're real, real people, real places. And so Dr. Moore went to Bethesda and Fort Harker, and, um, and then more locally to Gatesville, Frederick's Forks, and Martin Falls. And that also included, of course, our staff, uh, but it also included involving faculty at the location. So SAC COC wanted to hear, the representative wanted He's from a school, okay, but he wanted to hear um, how we are connected. How is our faculty at other locations connected to what we do? Um, and, you know, this is always a challenge to get information out to worldwide locations. <coughs> Excuse me, to the worldwide locations. So we will have to continuously work on that to make sure that the instructor who is at Bethesda knows what we're doing here on campus and can get involved in that. Uh, let's see, this past calendar year, we, well, not we, you, you all developed 20 plus OERs. So we have gone back, and Steve Davis provided some stats on that over the last few years, how OER progression has come along, and it has come along well. Um, so, of course, more courses to come, but what you do truly has a significant impact on our students, um, because it means they don't have to purchase a textbook. Um, and that is a great relief for some of them. You know, some students are right on the verge, but maybe they can go to school. So not having that textbook expense is huge for them. Uh, let's see, so I mentioned a, a lot of thank yous, and of course there are many more. I know you support all the events um, that we do on campus, that we do off campus. What I would do in the past is tell Dean Anderson or one of my deans, can you, can you round up a couple of people, two people, we have three slots, we have eight slots, we have the table to fill in. So they did that, and uh, it is wonderful to see you at these events. So your participation is vital. Just a few more updates. Um, so we had, so last year, <clears throat> we had several long-term employees leave. So the challenge for me was, okay, I, I need to fill these positions and I need to make sure I have good qualified people um, who come on board. So that really started at the beginning of, at, rather at the end of March when Dean Dawson came on board. So he's the Dean for, um, uh, what is he the dean of? He oversees adult education, continuing education, and workforce initiatives. So um, adult and workforce initiatives, that's who he's the dean of. So he came on board, he made friends in the service area, and uh, thanks to that, we are expanding our programs for credit and non-credit programs in the service area. Um, he brought some continuing education courses we already had this past summer and on passes and other places. So, uh, great things to come. He's expanding, working on expanding the Ford program. So very grateful he's on board. And as you know, Dean Anderson and Kirsten Brooks left in December. And um, <clears throat> thankfully, Dr. Fisher joined us as the Dean of Instruction. And uh, just in the short time that he's been here, he's taken a lot of initiative. Um, and I have absolutely no doubt that under his leadership, um, that your programs will grow and they will flourish. And um, looking forward to working with him. Um, we have more conversations with Copper's Cove ISD, Colleen ISD. They want to bring more programs um, to us, as in more students to us, um, that will take dual credit courses. We also have visits planned with uh, Texas A&M Central Texas. And we have been working with them in the past. We had joint department chair meetings, and we want to make sure we have those again in this year. Let's see. Dean uh, Davis, since you're giving an update in a bit, I don't want to say a whole lot, but uh, can I say what happened with Blackboard? Can I say it? Oh, well, you say it. OK, all right. So Blackboard moved to the cloud. And um, that's great progress. And what that might potentially mean is that in the future, we may not need a quiet need to have a quiet week. We'll find out. Um, Fort Hood Continental Campus at Fort Hood, we are getting a new ESO that is coming on board um, very shortly. And so 
Um, as you know, the ESO is the person who drives what happens in education, and so we're very much looking forward to meeting that person and, and working with her. We know it's her. <laughs> and um, of course, in the meantime, uh, Dean, um, uh, Dean Hare and her team, they're supporting students with um, services and instruction. Our continental science had some challenges with pivoting back and forth between remote services and services in, in the offices. And so it, I can truly say it has been somewhat of a challenge um, serving students um, that you know, are taking classes. But um, hopefully it will be getting better in the sense better that we can just provide continued services in one mode. I think that would be very beneficial to students. But uh, we have all become very technology savvy, so there's certainly something new that came out of this. Let's see. So um, also, I, I said a lot of thank yous to you. Um, I also want to thank the chancellor who has left, my fellow deputy chancellors, because so many things that we do are uh, interconnected. And so we realize that when in our staff meetings, when we meet, when we say, OK, well, when we do this, this has an impact on other areas. So, um, thank you for the great teamwork, and I wish all of you a very happy, great 2022. Our next speaker is Deputy Chancellor of Academic and Student Success, Dr. Robin Garrett. Based on this product, let's, let's pray for that. 
Um, we are transitioning from National Student Clearinghouse to parchment for our transcript, electronic transcript. As you know, a couple of years ago, we went to that and it was very successful. We all the complaints about delays in receiving transcripts were eliminated. We it was a wonderful transition. However, we found some hiccups with National Student Clearinghouse, so we're moving to parchment. Parchment will also allow students to obtain a digital diploma should they need it uh, moving forward. A little bit of a hiccup with KISD uh, Chrome equipment. If you've asked your students to submit papers to the library for review before they turn them into you, um, and their early college high school students are KISD and Chrome, the library's not getting it. Uh, for some reason, there's some glitch. Um, if you're requesting that, they're, they're trying to fix it, but you may want to tell your students to use a different computer to send it into the library. ARP money. CARES Act money, we still have about three or four million dollars to give out this spring. Please encourage your students to apply. I don't want to give back to the government. I want to give it to our students. Let them benefit from it. So please, please ask them to apply. Very, very little conditions on that. All I gotta do is say they were impacted. Um, new student orientation. Uh, we're having a virtual one January 13th from 9 to noon. Thank you to all of you that participate in the new student orientation, they love hearing from faculty. They don't want to hear from us, they want to hear from you guys. Right? <laughs> Aren't you <laughs> Welcome week. You're going to hear a lot more about everything in Julie's area later on. But welcome week is January 18th through January 28th. And the big welcome back bash is January 20th. So um, the title of that is Yo Ho Ho and a semester of success. I can't wait to see how that, that plays out. But we're having a departmental door decorating contest. So, so I hope you'll, you'll participate and, um, and uh, help, help get, get the feeling of connectedness, which is what I'm going to talk about in a minute um, at the college. Um, contact to the success and persistence to get a table at the Welcome Bash. And uh, thank you for doing the career cluster presentations January 24th through the 27th. The students love those. They get so much information from you about the programs. Um, they make decisions and based on what you say and now where they're going and what their options are after they complete the program with CTC. So thank you. Uh, as Dr. Aidy mentioned, uh, we did complete, finally complete our fifth year review, which was in 2020, now we're in 2022, but we did complete it at the end of last year and we were very successful. So any of you that, that participated in any of the, the actual um, five year as well as the off-campus instructional site uh, reviews, thank you for all that help. But that means we're rolling right into our decennial review. 2025 is when we go, we are up for reaccreditation with SACS. And you say, we're only 2022. Well, we have to submit all of our paperwork in 2024. Plus, we have to develop our QEP, our Quality Enhancement Plan. So we have a lot of work to do be between now and when we submit in 2024. So stand ready, because we're going to need, need a lot of help moving forward. We're going to need <coughs> QEP help. We're going to need information to fill out the forms correctly and, fill up and do all of our narrative for SACS so that we can become reaccredited in 2025. That's a lot of our prize on that. Uh, the Chancellor already thanks you for uh, serving on coordinating board committees, uh, transfer advisory committees, subcommittees, which are uh, based on your specific uh, area of expertise with you teach. Uh, I know Angela serves on one of those. We've had several of you serve on them, as well as the Workforce Education Course Manual uh, review of the courses within that. We have, I think I've got two out, right, Dean Fisher, I'm asking for someone from sociology for the transfer advisory committee and someone in manufacturing mainly and as well for the workforce education course manual uh, meetings and review of courses. So if you're willing and you're in that area, please let Dean Fisher know so that I can get you nominated. Uh, let's see. Huh. This is a sad thing. Many of you know Barbara Merlo. She is the director of marketing and outreach for um, to help get our students in. She works with um, the advertising agency and all of her team works to get our students here and keep them here. Well, she is retiring at the end of this month, January 31st, and I'm very, very sad to see her go. And um, yesterday, 
My assistant notified me, Deb Walker, that she is retiring as of January 31st. So uh, please bear with us as we, we find people to fill those big shoes and we'll work toward uh, continuing uh, to make CTC better with whatever we can do. So thank you there. Now on to what I wanted to, to uh, talk about, connectedness. The, um, my, this is my word for this year, connectedness. We have uh, a chance to even kind of uh, gave you a preview when I mentioned him what I was talking about. I said, oh, still my thunder, but he, 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 uh, he kind of gave you a preview. Our students need to be connected, as he, as he said, and there's so many studies out there that I will be tracing when I say studies, but uh, out there about um, how students will persist at the colleges if they feel connected to the college through clubs, through activities. And Julie's team and the rest of my team are doing a, a lot of work to put things out there, help students feel, feel that, that sense of home when they come to Central Texas College. And the chance will challenge you guys to do the same. But I want to show you some facts, some data that's out there that anybody can see about Central Texas College and what we uh, what we offer our students and where we fall within the region as well as the state. We are doing the best job in the state. We in Clarendon are the best in the number of semester credit hours to completion for our students. 64. Give yourselves a hand on that one. That one is amazing. Statewide average is 81 semester credit hours. So we are doing fantastic. However, there's always a however, it takes our students a little bit longer to get those 64 credit hours, which uh, should. Clarendon uh, Community College does it in 2.6 years. We do it in four years. Our students take that four years average to get their associate's degree. Uh, the worst, of the, the statewide average is 3.9. So um, we're not far from the statewide average, but since we have the lowest much credit hours, it'd be nice if, if we could bring the time to completion down as well. Now, however, our graduation rates are not the best. Actually, they're the worst. <laughs> we are the lowest in the state um, for our six-year graduation rate. You say six years? Well, yes, a lot of our students take six years to complete. And as far as three-year, we're in the bottom four. So what that means is either they're not completing or they're just taking a long, long time to complete. So we need to get our students connected to something, feel part of it, and keep them moving forward to complete. Now, our, my team reviewed this data, and they reviewed a lot of other data in my 1010 meeting that we had in October. And there's a lot of reasons. And I know going through your head right now, I think I can see them floating around, <laughs> all the reasons why we have these, these numbers so low. But all I'm asking is can we move the needle a little bit? Can we see if we can change some of these reasons? Can we see what we can do to do a little bit better with these numbers? So let me tell you a little bit about persistence. Now, it might be hard to see. I don't know if you can see it. But the section that has the lowest, who is that? That's us. That's CTC. This is persistence from term one to term two, from fall to spring. This includes full-time and part-time, these numbers. So I'm going to show you the breakdown, part-time and full-time in a second. But in 2019, which means fall 2019 to spring 2020, right? And you say, gosh, that seems old, but it really isn't. Because the only numbers I don't have right now are fall 2020 to spring 2021. I'm sure those numbers aren't very impressive with the pandemic. So if you look at fall 19, CTC's persistence of our, all of our students is 62%. We're the lowest in our region. So then let's see what the state's doing. The statewide persistence from term one to term two for full time and part time is 75%. Again, we're at 62%. So we need to help our students feel connected to the college so they will continue from fall to spring. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> um, there's a lot of data behind this. And when you break out and say, well, we have a lot more part-time students. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but our full-time persistence from term one to term two, not including part-time, is at the same as the state, 75%, which includes both full and part-time. So our full-time students persist at a rate of 75%. Our part-time students persist at a rate of 
Now, you say, well, have we asked them why? Have we tried to figure that out? And yes, we do. We survey the students, we contact the students. If they're stopping out, we try to get that information. And an easy box to check all the time is financial. The financial need, I, I can't do it because of finances. But if you look at the next two rows down, our Pell students, the ones that get it totally covered, their persistence from term one to term two is 64%. So you wonder, is it, it might not be the whole tuition and books and all that issue. There's something else there. I don't know. I know there's family impacts. I know there's things, other things that come. But 64% is pretty low for our health students that get covered, plus they get balance checks to not come back. So we need to delve into this a little bit more and figure out what, what, the, what we can do to move that needle and, and get our health students, and even our non health students, obviously, at 60% to persist. So I know you guys can think of much bigger things than I can. So this, this Dr. Seuss was the theme for my 10-10 meeting. So I think you can think of bigger things. I bet you can. I know. <laughs> you can speed up your bigger uppers as fast as it will go. So please, if you have any ideas, if you could do anything to help our students persist and stay with CTC, please do. Please let me know. Please let my staff know if you come up with some grand ideas. And thank you very much for everything you do. And my door is always open. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Garrett. Um, our next speaker is Deputy Chancellor of Administration and Finance, Dr. Michelle Carter. Otherwise, 
uh, I might be a little salty about it. <laughs> so I acquired the Navy Campus Operation and your Campus Operation as well as the Foundation under my area of responsibility. It, it is, it's been a bit of a learning curve, but I, I think we're doing okay. So from the Finance Department, I would just simply uh, say thank you. We were, uh, the auditors completed our 2021 fiscal year audit this past December, and we were able to present to the board a clean audit, uh, which is always a good thing. But as Bob Liberty likes to say, Bob Liberty is the Associate Deputy Chancellor for Finance and Administration and our Comptroller. As he often says, it takes all of us. And so I have the, the, the privilege and the pleasure, if you will, of reviewing every single requisition that comes through the college and also looking at our finances monthly. And we couldn't do it without the, the diligence of, of you all, without uh, you considering what you're purchasing and what you need. Uh, so thank you for your support and your contributions in ensuring that we have a clean audit to present to our board. At the end of the year, that's what you want to hear, and that really tells us how well we did. And so thank you. As it relates to business services, that would be Mr. Ted Gonzalez. He's sitting up top there. Yes, Ted, I called you. Ted is, uh, in addition to being an adjunct faculty member, he is our associate working for Dr. Reese. <laughs> he is our associate deputy chancellor for business services. And primarily, he's responsible for auxiliary services, materials management. Uh, it, it, he actually has two smaller divisions within his division. And what I'd like to share from his area is textbooks, because I know that's important to you. And so what I'd like to share is that the, uh, I, the newest update, as of this morning, hot off the press, is our textbook orders are coming in um, as scheduled, so we're glad about that. But as, as Mr. Gonzalez shared with the department chairs during the meeting, what we have done, uh, his staff, and specifically in the bookstore, has established some vendor relationships whereby we're able to provide uh, electronic copies of some of these materials to, to mitigate any supply issues. We are subject to the same supply chain issues as every other industry. So, uh, so far we've been fortunate for the, the spring 2022 semester. Uh, did I get it right, Ted? Okay. Also in Mr. Gonzalez's area, there's been a uh, there's been a change. He has acquired a new department, uh, business development, and that would be the department that handles grants. So I want you to know, you know, grants <laughs> grants has been like a hot potato in this institution. <laughs> I mean, literally, it's like your turn, your turn, your turn. Uh, for me, it's come full circle because about 10 years ago, we created the first grants coordinator position, then it jumped over to Dr. Garrett's area, and then it jumped over to the chancellor's area, and now it's back in finance and administration. So Mr. Gonzalez is examining the current processes and in an effort to improve how we, uh, how we uh, vet grants. And uh, which allows us to get, uh, which hopefully will allow us to get more information on the front end uh, prior to the DCs having to review it and we can have all the answers that we need up front and uh, expedite that process. I know for me, I can sit on something for a few days if I don't understand what that grant is, is all about. So uh, I'm excited about that. Mr. Uh, Gonzalez is a proven, proven administrator and has a, a strong background in uh, private industry and a strong business acumen. And so I am excited uh, about uh, the, the new challenge or opportunity to excel, excuse me. So, and Dr. Reese will not be going full time. So, you know. Okay, in uh, HR, Holly Jordan will be speaking to you a little later about a few things, but what I wanted to share with you is uh, just just for informational purposes, and I think the department chairs may experience this as well, we, we, uh, we are having a very difficult time filling positions. So what you see in the news as, as it relates to other companies and industry, it is no different for Central Texas College. Uh, the foundation director, which I'll talk about here shortly, I had that position posted for about eight months, 
and I was finally able to fill it. And I tell you, I don't have a background in foundation, uh, but there were some in, in foundation operations and college development, but I had to quickly learn some things. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll get to that shortly ahead of myself, and I'll talk about our new director there. Holly reported that last week we had the smallest new employee orientation in years. So uh, if anybody's looking for a job, send them our way. <laughs> uh, we have plenty of jobs that we need to fill. And, the, and the, the problem with that is as those positions go unfilled, it's more work for those of us who are here. And we recognize that. So uh, if you have some ideas or you know some people, please point them to our website. In the uh, facilities and construction, Mark Harmson, <laughs> You know, if he's not tearing up the mall area, <laughs> if he's not tearing up something, right? Well, we were hoping to have that road work complete before you all came back from the break, uh, but contractor issues, uh, it, it wasn't done. So Mark and his staff, Mr. Uh, Jordan, they are working diligently to, to get those roads complete. Uh, it was necessary that they be done, obviously, we would have grown up. Uh, but we're hoping to get that resolved here in the next uh, couple of weeks. It would be nice to have it done before the students come back, so just hope with me, okay? Uh, Mark Harmson also, Mr. Harmson also continues to work on the Department of Justice uh, project. If you, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this last time I was here, but a few years ago, the Department of Justice uh, sent out a team to evaluate our campus, and it had to do with disability issues and our proximity to Fort Hood and veterans and uh, their accessibility uh, to our campus and various services. It was an extremely comprehensive exercise and we signed a contract with the department uh, giving us three years to correct various issues. So that is ongoing. So if you see Mark or Mr. Harmson or our contractor or someone from his area show up in your department or in your building, they are uh, resolving the several outstanding issues identified by the Department of Justice. Um, risk meant legal affairs is, is the, the name of the division, and that's led by Ms. Deborah Shively. Under Ms. Deborah Shively, we also, uh, under legal affairs, we have risk management and student employee assistance. And so what I wanted to share with you from the student employee assistance side, led by Dr. Mahone Lewis, Lewis and Ms. Nadia Villanova, we are continuing to offer uh, support to our students. They are, most of that work is telework uh, or telehealth, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, but they see a number of students every week. And so if you have a student that is in distress or you sense that something is going on, please direct them to those services. Uh, we've been really keeping busy in that area. It's a wonderful service. Uh, that they provide, and uh, we want to make sure that our students are aware of it and avail themselves of, of that. Uh, in risk management, we have a new director of risk management, and that would be Mr. Larry Murphy. I believe he, you all have met him, uh, well, in Dr. Amy's area, and I believe Dr. Garrett's as well. Mr. Murphy is, uh, he's, a re he's retired military, I have a soft spot, no, no offense to the officers, but I have a soft spot for senior NCOs. <laughs> I once told my husband who was a retired senior NCO, you guys do the work. And so Mr. Murphy comes to us from the, from the military, he's retired military. Uh, risk management, emergency management, we are very fortunate in that that is his background. And so he has hit the ground running he is working with us to update our COVID guidelines. Um, some of you may or may not know when the pandemic hit, we, uh, the chancellor, uh, uh, we put together a COVID task force, which I was able to lead, and it's a cross-functional team. We haven't had to meet in a little bit, but it's a cross-functional team of all of our areas. So uh, he has hit the ground running there. We're updating the guidelines. The big thing for you is that uh, we have, we are adopting the CDC's uh, recommendations for five-day uh, quarantine, insert those five-day rules. Uh, but there's some things that we're going to keep. So uh, just know that those guidelines, will, they're being reviewed by Ms. Shively today, and we'll get those posted. 
So we have quite a bit going on in our area, but for the sake of time, I'm going to sit down. Uh, but also just let you know, uh, Valerie Payson joined us in the Foundation and College Development Office. We are continuing to see food insecurities, housing insecurities, etc. So if you have students with issues, please send them to the College Development Office. We have a food pantry. We are constantly receiving contributions in goods and, and financials. So uh, again, we've got a lot going on, but I'm going to sit down because I could do this all day and you guys have quite a bit ahead of you. Again, thank you for all that you do. My extension is 1331. I'm in building 108. If you ever need to talk to me, you have a suggestion, a question, or just want to know more about anything within finance and administration, just let me know. Nobody in this room knows my father. He doesn't know you. But let me introduce you to him briefly. 
My father is a high school graduate who, who was a small business owner, owned a paint and glass business in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. On uh, 664 North Main Street, was a successful business owner. And uh, I'm, I'm the third of four children. And my destiny uh, while I was growing up was that I would take over the family business. Um, I was not a college-bound high school student. Uh, so I had accepted my fate. About 30 days after high school graduation, it became clear to my father and I that maybe that was not the path that I was uh, <laughs> going down. So now I'm there. I have uh, I have no plan, but I did have a best friend, Bob. So my best friend, Bob, had no plan really either. So uh, on a Friday evening, he said, um, my brother was in the Navy. Let's go talk to a recruiter. And I said, okay, that sounds good. So we woke up the next morning, and we walked down to the recruiting office, and there, that back, back when they were co-located, you had the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, and the only person there was Staff Sergeant Bell from the Air Force. So we said, hey, let's join that. Right? It must be destiny, right? <laughs> so as a couple months later, as I'm getting ready to board the Greyhound bus to take a trip down to Milwaukee and, and go through the uh, entrance station and start my journey, my father said, you know, Dan, you're going to go lots of different places, be asked to do lots of different things, and work with and for lots of different people. Some of those people, places, and things you will like. Some of those people, places, and things you won't like. Whether you like it or not, doesn't matter. Your challenge is to leave it better than you found it. My father. My Eureka. In the mid-1990s, I had the good fortune to spend some uh, time to share some space with Colonel Ed Hubbard. Ed Hubbard was the, a prisoner of war in Vietnam. He was held the second, he, he, he was held prisoner, was, he was the second prisoner of war captured. There we go. Okay. So he was interred six years and seven months. And he would regale us with stories, not about the not about the challenges and the difficulties and the torture, and the, but he would tell us stories about about the resilience of the captors. That despite having no books, no pens, no papers, often no communication beyond a tap code, they were able to achieve and communicate and, and achieve great things. But we had prisoners of war who, who established Guinness World Records for most consecutive push-ups and most consecutive sit-ups and jumping jacks, right? So despite those horrible conditions, despite the lack of resources, they were, they were able to achieve greatness. In fact, Colonel Ed Hubbard was fluent in Spanish, uh, and, and he taught his, his fellow prisoners, without the use of books, papers, pencils, and by a tap code, the Spanish language, to the point where several of them when they were when they were free and repatriated, they went back and they collect three, six, nine, and twelve hours of college credit. Incredible, incredible. He wrote a book about it, uh, and his his whole his whole concept is that human potential is nothing more than a state of mind. If you think you can, you can. If you believe you can, you can. Conversely, if you think you can't, you won't. If you believe. I believe we can. My mentor, this is Chief Master Sergeant Ron Creed, long since retired. I worked for him in Tucson, Arizona. One evening, he was headed home to his family and friends, and uh, he drove past my office, and he saw my light on. And he, he knocked on the door, and I opened it, and he's like, hey, Dan, what are you doing? I said, oh, Chief, let me show you. I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. He said, stop. Stop what you're doing and go home. Go home to your family, go home to your friends, go home to your hobby, go home to your place. Self-care is what we call it today. If I said, no, chief, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, he said, stop what you're doing. Whatever it is, can wait until tomorrow. Otherwise, at the end of your long, successful career, there will be nobody on your right, nobody on your left to hear your stories and share with them. What we do matters, but so does family and self-care and 
copy and getting it all out of the job. My service, uh, I, I told you my entrance in, I served 30 years in the United States Air Force, quite proud of that. I, I rose from my Airman Basic to the highest enlisted rank and spent some time Air Force Special Operations. <coughs> What really appealed to me in that community is that the answer to everything was always yes. There is a yes answer to everything. <laughs> However, uh, no is acceptable as well. It's all, <laughs> it, is, it is all about determining the risk. So, so you're, you're out there wondering, can we do this? The answer is yes. I wonder how we would do this. The answer is yes. Let's try it. If we're willing to accept the risk. So you got to put all the cards on the table. You got to get all the smart people around. Uh, you you got to get gather all the input that you can, and then you've got to you've got to arrive. You got to assess the risk, and if the risk is worth it, then by God, let's do it. But if the risk is not worth it, then we we owe it to everybody to say no. My college has uh, been fortunate since retirement to uh, retirement from. <laughs> From active duty to um, spend time in a four-year institution that had graduate programs as well so I bring that perspective and then more recently uh, two community colleges the last six years here in the state of Texas so the higher education boarding board the higher education boarding board is familiar to me uh, uh, SAC COC I've lived under that umbrella for a couple of institutions so I have uh, an affinity for for uh, compliance, right? We just have to, right? So I understand all that. So all of that has influenced me and um, my approach to things. Let's talk leadership for a moment. I direct your attention to this, this inverted uh, triangle. In most organizations, right, the triangle is, uh, is more of a pyramid, right? There's a lot of workers down here that support the, the next level of supervision here that supports some uh, additional level, uh, probably unnecessary, of supervision here. And then there's you know, this, this, uh, this top cap, right? So in, in what we do, the way I approach my position is that I am here to support you all. You're not working for me. I'm working for you. Most directly through the department chairs, that would be my, my, my primary uh, uh, interaction, but faculty, I'm coming for you, right? I, I, we've got to establish a relationship across our 140 full-timers and like, as best we can, our 400 uh, adjuncts that are, that are doing great things and making a difference every day here. And you say, well, my God, Dan, that's gonna fall over. Well, what you don't see over here is our senior leadership team, our executive team. They're there supporting us to make sure that we can do what we need to do. And then sitting over on this side is all of our student affairs, student success partners doing the exact same thing. And oh, if we could, we would add the top of the pyramid is the students. We're all showing up every day, giving our best effort, focused on the education and learning environment for our students. I'm all in on uh, post-secondary education. I am passionate about what we do. I believe that 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 we, we ought to invest our energy in the direction, right? In the learning and teaching that goes on here. And there and we ought to do it with some enthusiasm. That gets us over all the challenges, all over all the hurdles, over all the whatnots or the whatever's going to come, right? Situational leadership, right? I subscribe to, to the Blanchard Hersey model, right? If um, if you don't know how to do something, then we've got to train you, right? That's some directed leadership. If you're well versed in, in what you do, then we'll leave you alone, right? We're gonna we're gonna apply some delegating leadership, right? You don't need us in your business, right? It's about assessing your competence and your commitment. If you if if you need to, to learn something, we ought to provide that training. If you already know how to do it, you don't need more training, right? What you need is to be buoyed and uh, and uh, supported in as you move forward. Every one of you is a purple circle. You probably didn't know that. That's the way I view you, right? Everybody in this room and everybody that's going to be viewing it asynchronously, you're a purple circle in my mind, right? Needs behavior goals. You all have needs. You all set goals, and then you choose some behavior to achieve those goals, both personally and professionally. 
and, and that behavior is influenced by your interests, your attitudes, and your values. You all have a personality, right? Some total of your habit patterns as viewed by others, right? So people are watching you and, and, uh, and uh, making judgments all the time. You have a self-concept, how you view you. And ideally, in a perfect world, we have some type of congruence between your personality and your self-concept. How you view you is how others view you. If there's a lack, then if, if, if somehow those are, are lack of congruence, then uh, you're not receptive to feedback. It works. <coughs> conflict management. We all deal with conflict in a certain particular way. We respond to it. Frustration and adjustment. Uh, this job is, uh, is, is full of frustration on occasion. It's how we react to that. And then finally, motivation, right? There's this motivation piece, right? So everybody in here is a purple circle. So with that, I subscribe to the one minute manager theory. We ought to be wandering around, we ought to be catching, we ought to be catching people doing things right, and then we ought to stop in the moment and say, my God, what you did was just absolutely fabulous. I noticed, pause, and then say, man, I can't wait to see what great things you do next. And then you go on your way. Conversely, One Minute Magic subscribes to, uh, as you're walking about and you see things that uh, people performing that aren't just quite right, you've got to stop in the moment and say, um, that, that wasn't just quite right, so let's do a little bit of redirection, let's do a little bit of coaching, here's some resources, and then, um, Got it, good. Can't wait to see the next product, and then you move on, right? We're not keeping tally marks, we're not keeping tick marks, we're not doing that. We're addressing it in the moment. One minute, man. Communication, we cannot over communicate. The connectedness piece, right? We cannot over communicate. I'm not a fan of email, I realize it's a necessary evil. We all tend to operate by that, okay? Um, We'll accept it, but my preferred method is to engage this way, right? Is to have a conversation, is to get together, is to gather, is to have a community, as to, um, I find it easier to just walk into your office to come and speak to you, and uh, and and we, we, can, we can do more in a five minute conversation than we can passing 37 emails back and forth and scanning and all that sort of stuff, so we can. It's just a matter of approach. I'll come to you. I sit in my energy sucking chair too long, next thing you know, I feel like I'm dying, right? So again, <laughs> I've got to get up. And if I'm dead, I'm no use good, no good anything. Meet by example, I won't ask you anything that I'm not doing myself. Manage it by wandering around, right? Managing chaos, you just got to get out and about. I subscribe to both of those uh, philosophies. So expect to see me out and about, invite me, and, uh, and I'll be there. ABC door. We've got a lot of things going on. Just since in my short time here, let's see. There are e, there is E tree, right? <laughs> that wasn't part of the interview process. Right? <laughs> Surprise. Okay. So so how do we manage all that, right? I, I can't even I can't even recount all the types of forms that have been coming through, right? But we're, we're getting, we're, we're keeping up with it. We're, we're getting through it all, right? So, so, um, so, so, so there's a lot to be done. There's requisitions, and then there's the daily grind, and then there's the, the, the managing the, you know, the tearing of the version, right? Whatever springs up on any particular day, right? So how do I do it, right? I tend to subscribe to an ABC drawer. Think of it as three inboxes stacked. Uh, the, the, a, the top one is my A drawer, right? Those are items that, that require uh, attention by my position, right? I can't delegate that to anybody. So, so I promise you that, 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 that in there are those E-tree forms in a timely manner. It's the, it's the email approvals for, for cow sales and calf sales that we do. It is, it is, uh, it's all important, and, and you can't wait, by God, because auction is Saturday, so I'm ready. <laughs> so all that is in the A drawer, and all that has my attention, right? That's my focus in the day. So I start with a plan, and then I open my A drawer. That's just how I manage all this stuff. And my commitment to you is that is that I will keep up with, with that churn. Right? That's my promise. I will keep up with that churn. Second to that is the bee drawer stuff. These are items that, that, I don't know, maybe a towel sale is going to be a month, right? So we've got some time to play with that, right? So we don't have to deal with it today. We can tackle some other chores. Uh, that's the bee drawer stuff. And some of that, quite frankly, isn't, isn't so hot that we can't delegate it to somebody else. 
if only we had someone to delegate it to. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll follow on that. That's coming. That's coming. There will be opportunities, opportunities to serve in the future. We're working on it. We're working on it. And then the seed drawer stuff is, uh, you know, those are the items that, that don't necessarily require my attention or are not today, and by God, they can just sit there. Uh, eventually, they'll work their way up into the B drawer, and then the A drawer, and then you know, our goal is to deliver, make all of our deliverables on time, early as possible. I, I, I will not be that rectangle in the flow chart that slows the processes down. I will not be that rectangle in the flow chart that slows the processes down. Core values. Integrity first, right? Uh, say what you mean, mean what you say, or keep your mouth shut, right? Or don't say it, right? That's sort of the approach there. Um, okay, enough there. We got to get going. Right? <laughs> you want to have lunch? Right? Change philosophy. So let me let me chat about this for just a minute, right? Uh, two eyes, two ears, one mouth. We have this conversation during the interview process, right? If, if I'm the one that's doing all the talk and I'm not learning the dang thing, right? So I, I get no smarter uh, if, if I'm the one that's always chatting. So so I, I love listening. I love processing. I love uh, I love to observe. I like to get out and see things firsthand. Uh, it, it just it's, it's, it's how I it's how I process uh, what's going on, and, and that you know certainly informs uh, uh, my response and my reply and all that. We are good. We can be. Good or right? okay, I know, I know. It's now it's captured for ever, but we, we are right. We we are good at what we do. By God, we are difference makers, and we make a difference every single day. And we have some solid processes and some solid procedures. But but we could we could be even better, right? We we can. And those candidates for change, those candidates for improvement, those processes that probably could do a tweak or two. Uh, in fact, I've got some thoughts on some of the e-forms that, that I've seen. Right? <laughs> That's a new guy, right? Okay. So, uh, I, I, think, I think we, yeah, we're not tackling it today because it's not age or stuff, but it, like, eventually we'll, we'll come back around. And we've got to be smarter today than we were yesterday. This harkens itself to sort of decision making. We can only make a decision right now based on what we know now, based on the information we have now, based on the circumstances as we see it now. But that could change with more information. If we learn something tomorrow, the circumstances change. If we make ourselves smarter, if we read something, if we find something in literature, we find a best practice somewhere, all of that could inform change and actually improve our processes. <coughs> I'm an unfreeze. This is Kirk Lewin right here, handsome, dashing devil, right? Um, those, those look like uh, Harry Potter glasses. Unfreeze, freeze, refreeze. So a simple process to change management. We ought to have a conversation. That's the unfreeze piece. We, we ought to be, hey, we ought to be pondering things. We ought to be thinking about things. We ought to be wondering things. And and, and that sort of starts the process. And then, and then we, we, we collegially discuss these things. And then we, we throw pros and cons back and forth. And we say, you know, maybe, maybe this, whatever this is, is uh, ought, ought to get some attention and ought to be changed. And here's our expected outcome. And then we sort of agree, and then we boldly decide, by God, we're going to do this. And based on everybody's input, all the right players at the table, we step forward and say, okay, here's our small-scale test on our new process. We execute, we tweak it, we get some feedback, we put it in the plan to check and act cycle, right, the PDCA, and then we we get some more until we're happy with it and and then it becomes a pretty tailor, the one right way, the new one right way, right? It becomes the new one. And we implement it and we go. Change for change sake just frustrates everybody. That's not the business we're in. It creates chaos, it creates turmoil, it creates uncertainty, it creates people could come to work. Improvement, on the other hand, we should be all in on that. Whatever it is we're doing, however it is we're doing it today, if it's a candidate for improvement, by get on, let's get it on the table, let's get the smart players at that table, and let's move forward. 
Chris, Dad, I'm a data guy. I like numbers. I like counts. I like collecting all that stuff. I do, right? That, again, is how I process things. But, you know, numbers on a spreadsheet are just numbers on a spreadsheet. They tell a story, but it is not, it is not a substitute for your gut. It is not a substitute for common sense. It is not a substitute for, for the wisdom that we all have. Just because it looks right on paper doesn't necessarily mean we discount our guts, our our experiences. See, so got the goofy stuff. I'm always uh, I'm always uh, on the lookout for some goofy stuff. I walked into the Clear Creek building. Is that what that's called? Right. Okay. So uh, if you've never been in there, uh, there, there's a lot going on in that building, right? Okay. I've been there many times, right? Uh, and and the first time I walked in there. I'm standing at the door, and and if you go to the left, there's carpet. There's carpet squares. And if you go to the right, you have to tiptoe because you'll make too much noise and disturb all the classes. Okay, that's goofy to me, right? So why isn't the whole building carpet? Right? That's another competition. It's one of those things, right? So I'm always on the lookout for goofy stuff. So if you got goofy stuff, and I know you do because rubber meets the road, right? So if you got goofy stuff, uh, bring it to my attention, and then maybe that'll be a candidate for some improvement as well. Okay. Expectations. Let me get through this. Faculty, your focus is teaching and learning. One more time. Faculty, your focus is teaching and learning. And then, yeah, that's 95%-ish, right? <laughs> And then the other 5% is, is, is your, your contribution to the college, right? Whether it's a committee work or a, or a program coordinator or uh, raising your hand for our education coordinating board uh, a commission or a panel, right? So the, it ain't all about teaching and learning, but uh, te teaching and learning, but that's your focus. That ought to be your focus. We ought to remove barriers that uh, prevent that. Embrace the shared responsibility philosophy. I'll speak to that just in a minute posture for maximum flexibility. If we have learned anything in the last 24 months, we have to be postured for whatever. So this is gonna require some inventory, this is gonna require some thought, this is gonna be, I don't know, you know, think, think about all the possibilities because uh, chances are we, we, we will have to flex with little to no notice. But it doesn't mean we can't prepare, it doesn't mean maybe we can't find some dollars, uh, some some federal dollars maybe even to help us get there. So think about think about your classrooms, think about what it is you do, your service delivery, and let's let's get a list. Let's make a request early and often and posture. I expect you everybody in this room to deliver their best effort on every task. I expect everybody in this room and those watching from afar to deliver their best effort on every task. Don't pass it along unless you would put your signature on it. Think globally. I'm learning this, right? I, you know, it, it is just too easy to, to think, and again, my upbringing, you saw my influences, right? I, I would encourage you all to join me in that. So as we think about our programs, as we think about our offerings, as we think about our modalities, as we think about our course sections, as we think about the future, as we think about what could be, I, I, I would encourage you to join me in, in thinking globally. I expect everybody to be present, driven by the modality of your teaching schedule. You advertise office hours, they start and finish, and you'll be there at those times. If you are scheduled for a face-to-face -face course, it starts on time, it finishes on time in the location that we advertise. If it's asynchronous delivery, it starts on time, it finishes on time, and it occurs as scheduled. That's what the students deserve, that's what our colleagues deserve and matter. What you do matters. What we do matters. And I expect all of us to contribute to that. Shared responsibility philosophy. I'll leave this here. 
uh, so you can look at it. But to me, this is an A plus B equals C. C is a, a, a fabulous educational experience, right? So in order to get there, we have a responsibility. The students have a responsibility. You can see that prepared as we go across, right? We must prepare ourselves to deliver a quality presentation, to foster engagement, regardless of modality, to all of the different learning styles that are pooled in our classrooms. We enforce the standards for all students, whether they're 15 or they're 55 or they're some other age, right? We apply standards evenly. We are present as scheduled, and then, quite frankly, I, you ought to enjoy this experience, right? We talk about passion, energy, and enthusiasm, right? It, you ought to look for, I, I hope you look forward to, to the next 16 weeks of the semester, and then when it's over, you say, you know what? We overcame, we, 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 we achieved, they achieved, and it was enjoyable. And, and for students, students have a responsibility, right? This ain't a free ride for them, right? This, this, this ain't sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> they got to prepare themselves, they got timely, right? Again, they're responsible for timely course and, and homework completion, uh, participating, engaging, and then we hope that they enjoy it as well. And then lastly, a glimpse into the future. This sign uh, is attributed, or this statement is attributed to lots of folks. It actually hangs on my wall. I love it, right? None of us is as smart as all of us, right? We all bring talents and experience, and, and uh, you saw some of my influences in there. But I'm telling you, I haven't seen it all. I haven't done it all. I certainly don't know it all, right? So, but when we all get together in, in some type of community, uh, it's amazing what we can achieve. It's, it's just and thinking back to Colonel Ed Hubbard, um, if you think you can, you can. And I think we can, whatever it is. Shared governance is sort of a hallmark of, of post-secondary education. Um, I, I, I tend to, to view it as um, sort of like uh, a non-exempt council, right? So our non-exempt employees, our hourly employees, you know, are, are work for a boss, uh, so there's this chain of command, and more often than not, the chain of command works, and, and, and it works going up, and it works on its way back down. But every now and then, those non-exempt employees ought to get together and just it, talk. And, and, and they ought to be able to feel, as a collective, to, to raise issues and raise concerns and have, a, and have a collective voice and have some input and, and some influence. They're not the decision maker, but it doesn't mean that their voice doesn't matter and that they can't be the driver of improvement and change. I feel the same way about faculty. We ought to have a mechanism. It could be a faculty senate. It could be a faculty council. It could be some similar election whereby, again, we, we we, we come together and we, we dialogue and we, we talk issues and we raise issues and we have input and we have a seat at the table, right? That's all part of shared governance. Those of you that have done some service time, right? Um, talk about senior enlisted folks, right? So, so in, in most organizations, there are some junior, there's a junior, uh, the junior soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines have a little organization, right? Typically a five, six, or the E5s and E6s, right? They get together outside of the chain of command and have discussion and dialogue and talk about issues and concerns that they have. And then they get an opportunity to present those, right? They, they, they don't make policy, they don't make decisions, but, 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 they, but they do have input, a collective voice in that regard. Same thing on the senior NCO side, right? Our senior list of folks get together. They don't have the authority to make it so, but they do have input and they get and, and, and we value that input. So I see as we go forward, we'll have more discussions about, about what this could look like as the spring unfolds. We gotta get the right players at the table, and then lastly, and I'll go off the stage, we are hiring. <laughs> You're hiring, we're hiring, right? So, um, uh, boy, God bless Kirsten, right? It's uh, Kirsten Brooks is gone, so we have an immediate uh, need, immediate, uh, we have an immediate need for, <laughs> for, for, for uh, an associate dean. So we'll be advertising that soon. So 
So I, I would ask you to, to review that, think about it, right? It's just another way to serve and to contribute to the institution. Um, um, and, uh, and I would welcome any one of you to join the leadership team. Yeah, you have, you have an overview, you gotta have a summer. Okay, so I open my Johari window. We, we talked about my influences, you now know my father. <coughs> talk a little bit about leadership and change, my philosophy and my approach to those, and my commitment to that, and then some expectations. Uh, I'm sure this isn't the end of the conversation. I look forward to having continuing conversations. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter. No, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I am tweeting in my life, right? So, uh, at least not that I know of, and certainly not publicly. Okay, so, uh, uh, but, but I look forward to continuing the conversation, and now, uh, I've got to get off the stage. So thank you very much. Thank you, Treasurer. Um, we, our next group of speakers will present on a new kind of post-pandemic student pitfalls and solutions. So we have uh, the Chair of Science and Agriculture, Dr. Andrea Foskett, Department Chair of Social and Behavioral Sciences, Dr. Tracy Cook, and Department Chair of Communications, Ms. Tammy Phillips.
with our students. And we're talking about these students who, who may have experienced some um, SEL instructional formats, and they're returning now to an in-person classroom. So within the classroom, these are some of the trends that they're seeing. And again, if you know some of these um, topics that are being discussed here, I think a lot of us have been uh, dealing with these trends or these issues, even pre-pandemic, right? Uh, I think it's just that some of these issues may have been amplified to a certain extent now in, in the uh, in-person pandemic classroom. So engagement is one of those sort of issues that we're seeing. Uh, students we're noticing are less involved and unprepared. So I mean, we, we've, we've seen students that uh, don't prepare for the classroom session. They come in and they're completely clueless as to what needs to happen. I think some of our students coming from an SPL um, approach may even not know what to expect in an in-person classroom anymore. It's almost like we've got to teach them what the expectations are and how to be prepared in order for them to get the most amount of information from lectures or labs or whatever the, the participation requires. Group work is something else we're seeing uh, problems with or trends with, is a lot of our students do not want to interact with each other. How many of us have had a classroom of students, some are very involved and <laughs> raising their hands, asking questions and being prepared, which is great, but there's a, a whole, uh, you know, another population of students they just kind of sit in their chair and uh, they, they don't quite know what's going on. They do not want to even turn around and interact with the student right next to them, much less answer your questions or kind of engage in the topics that you are teaching that day. Uh, some students honestly do not feel that they benefit from collaboration. Maybe this is the transition coming back from an SPL instructional format they may be, they've learned to rely on themselves. They feel like they can learn the material themselves without needing to talk to their neighbor or having to do any kind of group work or teamwork, which I think uh, presents a big problem with uh, courses that have labs or where we do need that teamwork, we need that group activity because a lot of the activities and skills that they are acquiring is through group work. And we want them to interact, but at the same time they are hesitant for a variety of different reasons. Socially distant, a lot of us are seeing this, is some students are just kind of nervous uh, being in a classroom with others, being next to students, uh, wanting to kind of maintain a safe distance uh, for health reasons. So fear of close proximity is something. And again, coming back to that concept of, uh, they've already been in an SPL classroom or even an online, fully online classroom, and they feel like they can handle it themselves. They don't really need to be in an in-person classroom listening to you or interacting with their fellow classmates. Here are some of the things we probably see uh, in, uh, like kind of outside of the classroom, uh, where we do have some expectations and we're feeling like uh, that there are some issues there that need to be addressed. Time management. Again, this is not necessarily um, during the pandemic age, it's even something that we've dealt with our students having issues with time management even, even prior to the pandemic. But I think it's amplified again. Um, students are not really spending the time to study the material that's discussed in the classroom outside of class time. We've all, we all typically advocate for every hour you spend in the classroom, you need to at least invest two or three hours outside the classroom doing your own personal study or, uh, or in a group format with study groups but we're not seeing that happening. And now I think a lot of this, well at least some of it, could be because students are very distracted right now. They have a lot of other commitments outside of just the classroom. They have other personal commitments. They're dealing with COVID, they're dealing with health issues just related to themselves, their family, their children, uh, uh, elderly family members, so on and so forth. And, and a lot of them are now having to work more, well, probably, right? You know, take on more part-time jobs or maybe a full-time job and several part-time jobs and come to class. And so they're not having enough time outside of the classroom to invest in studying, not completing assignments. A lot of us have run into those issues this past few semesters. Is we can't give you uh, a grade, we can't give you any points if you do not even complete your assignments. That's something I feel like we, we are seeing in our classrooms now. And this is something interesting, independent learning approaches. Again, I think a lot of students 
um, uh, for whatever reasons, may not really want to come to your in-person classroom, and they would much rather you maybe record your lectures or record the topics you're discussing and make it available to them on Blackboard or wherever, YouTube, and then they just learn the material themselves. So they've learned to rely on themselves. They want independent resources. They want little videos or they want the entire lecture recorded. They want lab activities that kind of give them an idea of what needs to happen. But they want to learn things themselves outside of the classroom. So that's the other end of the spectrum that we're seeing in terms of learning approaches and things that have changed during the pandemic era. <coughs> Okay, um, some other things that we've noticed with the students, academic deficiencies and shortcomings. Their skill sets, their foundational skills that they're coming into our classrooms with. Maybe they barely got by during SVL and they're coming to our classrooms and so they don't have that foundation that they necessarily need to be extremely successful in our classes. Uh, reading and comprehension of text, they're very hesitant to read anything, especially if it's tenuous. If it's long and arduous to read, they tend to, oh, well, I'll just watch the video. You should record your lecture for me instead. Um, memory recall, they're having trouble remembering things. Maybe you mentioned in the class, maybe it was from their studies and their notes, and they're having trouble recalling that. So we're seeing that in the students as well. And communicating, just simply communicating not only exactly where perhaps maybe confusions lie, but also possibly with, um, you know, communicating with other people, just learning to interact again. They've, they've lost a little bit of that. Now, some of the accommodations, we're seeing that students are liking now to request lots of accommodations from faculty. They have uh, greater expectations of assistance in the classroom, whether that's um, in from you directly or with a particular assignment. They expect recorded lectures or provided slideshows and notes. And uh, they expect greater flexibility. They want you to be more flexible with your due dates or with their attendance patterns. Okay? They kind of got very comfortable during SVL, and we're seeing that impact their expectations now in the classroom. All right, awesome. And so we're also noticing faculty are shifting what they're doing. <laughs> and so what we're seeing with faculty, first of all, is that faculty are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to go over this pretty quickly because we're at 10 minutes. So, and we're trying to get this to 10 minutes down from 20, right? Um, so faculty are having to figure out new, new balances, right? We've always had to balance, you know, with maintaining academic standards,
for engagement and increased participation. Obviously, um, as was mentioned, this is a huge struggle. We've had it forever, but now it's intensified, we feel. And so we're having to be even more proactive with engaging the students. And um, obviously, as, uh, in social and behavioral sciences, you know, we feel very strongly about not having Mickey Mouse kind of stuff, right, to make a class fun for students. We want them to engage at the college level. So our challenge is to get students excited in that experience, <laughs> right? So, so that's a challenge, and I, I just I see, again, a lot of really innovative uh, ideas and, and things coming up. All right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what we're seeing in online instruction with our 100% online students, right? Uh, so a lot of us have probably feel this, is that you, you've got a population of students who absolutely love in-person classroom. They learn best uh, when you challenge them in class with that group effort and actually interacting with the, with the instructor. Then you've got the other population of students who do not want to be in a classroom. They want uh, close flexibility as well. They prefer a completely online instructional format. But then last year we introduced this new format, which was synchronous virtual instruction, right? And so that was kind of almost a mix of characteristics. Uh, and so we're noticing that a lot of our students who have taken the synchronous virtual format, which was not in a classroom with, well, physically with others in, in the same room, but through the computer, but still interacting with their instructor and their uh, fellow classmates. I think a lot of students really liked that format and feel more confident now taking some of the completely online classes because they've gotten a feel for like some independent learning approaches. So what we're noticing here is now these students uh, who typically would have taken an, an OLL, an online class, now they have different expectations. They do not want a hands-off approach. like previously, right? I mean, and I know a lot of faculty are innovating constantly to try to find a happy uh, balance. A lot of students have new expectations. They expect, even though it's an online class, they still want more interaction with their instructors. They do want instructors, perhaps, um, if time allows, to allow for video lectures, right? not just a PowerPoint provided uh, for that particular topic, but also where they listen to the instructor explain those topics. Uh, they want more conferences, they want more um, Zoom or WebEx meetings where they get to talk uh, directly to the instructor, or maybe even study groups virtually uh, to kind of understand concepts better. They want more help and other resources available to them to help them be successful in, our, in an online class. And our faculty are doing a fantastic job of trying to kind of find uh, that balance where you know, they, can, they can be more accessible, which is awesome to our students, and a lot of our faculty continue to teach SPL online and in-person instructional formats during the same semester, and so we're kind of blending our teaching approaches, and I think that's really beneficial even for our online students. Okay, so when we saw that we had this topic, we realized that in 20 minutes, we would never be able to have a robust conversation on this, never mind allow everybody to provide their feedback. So what we're doing is, we're creating throughout the semester virtual forums for faculty to gather and share their experiences and their ideas. Um, and so it's a brainchild right now, but we're gonna get it started earlier in the semester. Um, we wanna create separate virtual sessions focused on, some focused on online instruction, some focused on lecture, and some focused on those with a lab component. Again, so that you guys can come together with your peers, share struggles that you're having, share some of the innovative things that you're implementing in your classes, resources that you're using to try to kind of ratchet everybody up with their instruction and what they're doing. Um, so this will include WebEx meetings. We also have an online manager who has volunteered to create a Google Doc where we would share frequent, frequently asked questions that kind of come out of these sessions. Um, for now, I'm the contact. Um, we will send out information through the department chairs, and this is for faculty with details on the session so that you know how to sign up, when it's going to be held, et cetera. So look for that, and we're going to start with early in the semester. And then most importantly, it's a professional development opportunity. So. <laughs>
Okay, so we are going to break um, at this time. Please return at 10 a.m. so we can get started with our next session. Please take your seats.
go to a, a doctor and they'll say, I am, I, I'm struggling in my class and I need, I need accommodations or I need services. They may not clarify to that medical doctor that they are both a high school student taking high school classes, but I'm also taking college classes. So that medical doctor will evaluate them and they will give us feedback of, in terms of the kind of accommodations that they want and they will give us accommodations that are more appropriate at the high school level. So the student and the parent will leave that meeting thinking, I'm going to get those accommodations both at the high school level and the college level. Things like, uh, yeah, I want my, this student, if they make below a 70, to have an opportunity to retake a test. Guys, that's not an accommodation that my staff will ever give to you that we expect you to give. Um, but potentially, that could be written in an IEP. Um, this student should only take multiple choice tests, things like that. Well, the student leaves that meeting, though, because they had a meeting with the faculty. They had a meeting with this doctor. The doctor didn't understand what was going on. And so now we have a student that has a false sense of expectations coming into us. And it creates frustration for them, and obviously for you guys. We acknowledge that. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to explain that I, it, it is a problem for students. So I, all I can ask is for your continued understanding when, that, when this does happen, let us know, because these are the kinds of things that we are trying to have meetings with students and uh, the parents to kind of explain that difference to walk, walk the students through some of those issues. Um, we, our typical kinds of accommodations are things that, uh, mostly they're testing accommodations, so it's like extended test time, so you'll either be like one and a half times or double time. It may be a separate testing location because the student is needing low distraction. We do not offer no distraction. That is an impossible expectation to get. It's low distraction. Um, some, some different technologies we will provide for students. I will give a note about note taking. Um, as you've heard, we are having real trouble getting certain positions hired, and so we are way down on note takers at the institution. And so not all of the, all of the students that have a note taker accommodation are receiving note takers. Um, however, that is a specialty thing that CTC provides. There are other ways to meet that accommodation. And so that's when we would reach out to you guys and say, um, hey, can the student, can you provide a copy, a set of your notes to this student? Or, you know, is there, could, could we reasonably make an, an announcement in class and ask the student, you know, identify who they're taking notes for, but can we get a copy of your notes and can those be shared? So there are other things that we can do um, with regards to that. Just need to let you know that we are struggling on that on on, on that one. Um, the students do have to request their accommodations every semester, so they have to turn in the documentation. They have to be approved. You will get an email about what those accommodations are but then the student has to every semester request those. It is not atypical for a student. Once they figure out their, call, their, their plan and how they operate, there are certain types of classes where they want the accommodations for. Maybe it's, it's, it's heavy reading or you know, I, I, you know, something like that, but they do well on the math side and they don't want them in that, that type of area. So it is not unusual for the students to pick and choose when they want their accommodations and when they don't. I will tell you with high school students though, we tell them uh, as a safety measure, request them always for all of your classes. Um, you can, as the semester goes, decline them, but we can't go back and retroactively give you those, those uh, accommodations if you have not asked for them. So what that means for you guys, and I'm sure you know this, if a student does not go through the process and does not uh, request their accommodations and you don't receive that email from our DSS office saying that they have accommodations and they, they have to take the test as every other student would take the test. Uh, there is nothing else that you can do for that student. Um, yes, you can look them cry on your shoulder, you could be empathetic as you would with any other student, but they did not request, and we can't go back, we will never go back and ask you guys to retest the or give the student this test over because it, we do not do things retroactively. Um, I will say that uh, I did want to make a clarification. The only time we really look at what's on the syllabus because we also don't give students extended time or because we get this a lot from our high school students. They want us to request to you that they 
get extra time to write a paper? Did they get two weeks additional time to submit this paper? Or uh, that, that you are gonna read it and give them feedback and then redo it? And we're like, well, we can't ask, we can't, you, you can ask the faculty of that. If they're willing to do that for all of the classes, that is fine. But that is not an accommodation that, that, uh, that we request. So we do not extend time on a paper or anything like that. If it is clearly articulated in your syllabus about what your due dates are and how things work, that is what the student is expected to abide by. The only difference that we run into is, let's say you give a plot quiz when you're taking the class, and it's nothing that is listed on the test. We, in that situation, we might have to give extended time and different accommodations for that kind of, of, of situation. Um, so if you're if you're doing that kind of thing, something that's out of the ordinary, not on your syllabus, um, you might want to talk to if you have a student, a DSS student in your class, you may want to talk to the DSS student just ahead of time, just to make sure that you know what you need to do. Um, this is I already talked about this. We're going to send you a copy of the letter uh, telling you what the accommodations are. Um, we do talk to students and we tell them they this whole notion. Uh, through DSS work with students when they make that transition from high school to college is they have to become their own self-advocate. You know, you don't have teachers in the class and you don't have counselors and you don't have necessarily <coughs> knowing the, the past history of the student. The students must self-identify and they must advocate for themselves. And this is part of the process where we're trying to teach the students that self-advocacy is that we tell the students it's critical that they have a conversation with you as the faculty and talk to you about what they need and what it's going to look like for you to talk to them. So we encourage them after a class, in the first couple of days of class, if it's an online class, to send you an email. Um, and all we ask is that you take the time to listen to them, hear what it is, and all that kind of thing. Um, big thing that I want you guys to understand is uh, we uh, will never ask for nothing that we do in disability support services is going to in any way diminish what you do in your course. We do not change expectations for your course. The course expectations are the same for all of the students in your classroom. And that's what we tell our students that we work with, is that we do not change the expectations. We may change how a test is administered and how much time you have on that test, and those <coughs> kinds of things, but in no way do we, do we ask a faculty member to fundamentally alter a course and make it different for one student to another student. Now certainly, as with the previous presentation, sometimes you guys are working through all, helping all of your students manage some of these issues and you make those things, but we do not ask for that in any way for any of our, of any of our students. Um, there are a lot of services that are available for students and, and our DSS staff will make referrals, uh, particularly a lot of our, our, our students that they work with. They are entitled to use the, the tutoring services and all the different services, but no more so than anybody else is entitled to. Uh, but we do work uh, very hand on hand in hand with those students. Um, again, this kind of talks about equal access, uh, they have to complete the same assignments as everybody else. They have to same, follow the same set of rules um, as everybody else does. Um, the one thing I, I do want to tell you is that um, we understand, because we've had several uh, several situations last year, uh, or last semester, particularly with um, dual credit students who were just plain confused about the, the um, accommodations process here at the institution, just in general, because it's so overwhelming. They've, they've, they've gone, many of them have gone, you know, 10, 12 years through the public education system, and they've had things given to them and walked through, and then all of a sudden they're being given this set of expectations. And it is incredibly uh, administrative. It, 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 um, th those students are being asked to do a lot. You know, fill out this form, and at a time when they, they may not understand, their very first semester, at, we're asking them to fill out an accommodation form through eTree. And this is before they've even started in your class sometimes. Um, and so there are issues, and, and it is a process to get them through. We acknowledge that, and that is one of the reasons why we are trying to reestablish and go in and do orientations and explain to students uh, and parents primarily 
how these things are different and how these things need to work. But if you know of a student that is frustrated that you think, you can reach out to us and we will reach out to the student. We will say, hey, or do you need to come in? Do we need to talk to you? Do we need to clarify things? The other thing is if you do have a DSS student, one of the things that we really have found that we absolutely have to do is we need to be individually with our DSS students and explain how things are different. We have found that that kind of alleviates the whole process for the semester. So if you are having issues in your classroom, whether it be a high school student or not, let us know and we will ask that student and the parent to actually come in and talk with us so that we can actually go through every step, everything that has to happen, uh, clear everything up um, because we do know it is very confusing uh, because they're operating in two worlds and we, we have to have some compassion for that and it's difficult and we acknowledge that. But in no way does that it ask you to minimize the requirements of your class and we will, we will never we will never do that. Did that answer some of the if, if anybody has a question though, please, Dr. Shank again, she's sorry she couldn't be here. Uh, please send issues. If we know that there were particularly concerns with the dual credit that we need to address, let us know. I'm gonna do could I do one more? I should look really quick. I wanted to do an overview very quickly about student conduct. Um, because there were also some issues in the classroom about some conduct issues. These are our conduct officers, and I wanted to make sure you understood who they were. Yes, Mayor Sully Vargas is out on leave, but the other person is Victoria McGee. If you have an issue in your classroom that is conduct related, what I'm going to recommend that you do is please reach out to one of us so that we can get involved ASAP. Um, if you have a situation, the most important thing that you do is you document what the situation is date, time, location, behavior, you send it by email to us and you let us get involved. What I cannot stress enough to you guys is us getting involved in a situation that you're having makes it serious for the student. All of a sudden they take it differently, even the dual credit students. And they're like, oh wow, this is, this is a big deal. Involve us. Don't let the situation in your classroom get over. Involve us. As soon as you want to start having a conversation with us, use us, that's what we're there for. Um, and so this kind of just walks through, you know, the importance of the documentation and reaching out to us. Um, we do, every, all of their behavior, whether it's a dual credit student or not, is they are held accountable to our code of student conduct. And the good news is they are asking us to come back in and talk to students, particularly about student conduct issues, whether it be academic misconduct or student misconduct, we're being asked to come back into those offer and really have that conversation with students and parents. And what we're talking about, it, it kind of plays into the disability issue too, is that uh, student, what we tell the students and parents is you are expected to act like adults in our classroom and to set and to follow a very basic set of expectations. And sometimes the expectations are different in the high school and the college. You're going to have to follow those. And if you will, if you'll read your syllabus, if you'll talk to your faculty member, if there's some very basic things you do, everything will be okay. Everything will be okay. And we kind of walk through the students and the parents with how to do that. And so I think as we're seeing more of that, we do hope it will get better for you guys. Um, but I just want you to know, if you do have an issue, please reach out to us sooner rather than later because that's what we're here for. Okay? All right. Thank you.
editing is different than it was before. Uh, we first learned of some issues with it, but I got an email just a while ago from an instructor who loves some of the new uh, features of it because now if you're copying something into a text box, it allows you to keep the formatting. So that's a good thing. <laughs> Yay! Okay, because uh, Blackboard's a little different now in SAS, looks a little different, uh, we will update our, our basic uh, Blackboard training that we offer for new faculty or faculty who haven't used Blackboard. That's going to take a while, so please bear with us. Uh, we will keep you advised of any issues that we find. Please let us know if you find any issues because, uh, you know, we work with Blackboard every day, but we may not see some of the things that you see as you're teaching your class. So if you'll let us know of some of the problems, we'll try to get them resolved right away. Okay, I am going to, I should not have worn my contact, I should have worn my glasses, because I can't see very well. Is this, here we go, yeah. All right, what I wanted to tell you about today is, uh, we've been working with my deep uh, quality uh, assurance coordinator, Amy Churchill, who does uh, spot reviews of courses after faculty are given the content to make sure that uh, they remain ADA compliant, that you have filled out all the uh, stuff you need to fill out, like updating your, your due dates, ensuring that you have your, your contact information listed because that has been an issue things like that. We're, we're also working with some of the online faculty managers to identify some of the common problems we have. And so we thought it would be nice to develop some really short training that will emphasize some of these topics that we have discovered. And so we have a new thing called Deep Training Course. And it's very specific with respect to some of the things we have found. Um, First of all, the purpose of it is to provide a, a quick and dirty, or at least a quick, uh, way to resolve some of the problems and to let you know. You may not realize that, that there's certain things that you need to do and you already forget. You know, if you don't teach a class every <coughs> semester, you probably forget that, oh, I need to do this and I need to do, to do that. So that's what this course is all about. Um, you can be referred to it by your supervisor. You can self-enroll. It's got uh, four different topics right now. You can do just one topic if that's all you need. There is a quiz at the end, and you do have to get 100% in order to be a completion. But it is random, <coughs> random block. There's uh, more questions. We have a test pool that is larger than the number of questions. So you will see different questions each time. Uh, so you'll have a lot of opportunities <laughs> All right, come on, give me a break. <laughs> okay, the topics that we talk about um, are course engagement, feedback, and more. This has been a problem, uh, a pattern with just a few people. Uh, we get complaints on the student evaluations about, you know, they, the students don't hear from their instructors the entire class time, which isn't a good thing. They also want timely feedback, and they want the feedback to be constructive. And so that is what this is all about. And like I said, we tried to keep it short. Uh, we have a little discussion. And what we did was we tried to find really short videos. YouTube has some wonderful videos. Some are not so good, but there's a lot of really good educational ones. We tried to make sure that they were ADA compliant, they are closed captioned. I think the longest one I found was five minutes. And so uh, if you were reviewing this topic, you would go over these videos. And then, like I said, we have a little quiz at the end. Uh, the next topic, like I said, I'm having a little trouble seeing it. I think I'm legally blind. <laughs> Okay, the next one is common errors in Blackboard courses. 
Well, because we kind of have a customized version of Blackboard, um, and we do things a little differently than some of the other schools, we did have to develop our own little video for this one. Um, I did it. I apologize. I hope you find it okay. But uh, it's a, a short video with closed captioning. I did find out how to do that for YouTube. You do have to go back through and make corrections because it doesn't always interpret what you say like right, but I think it's okay. And then we have a quiz at the end. The next topic is ADA compliance. You may make your parts of your course non-ADA compliant without even realizing it. If you take a table like the um, the course schedule out of Blackboard, uh, manipulate it in Microsoft Word and put it back in, it may have lost its ADA compliancy. Uh, it is possible that you've lost the hidden headers and things like that that will direct the screen reader. And so uh, this is set up just like all the other topics. We have a short introduction and then we've got some, um, some videos for you to look at. One I thought was really interesting was a blind person who actually does use a screen reader and he explains in it and demonstrates how the screen reader works. I, I, thought, I thought that was really a good one. <clears throat> a new thing with the text box I just discovered yesterday when I was responding to uh, an instructor's query about the text box is it now has an accessibility checker in the editing part of the text box. It's a little stick figure and if you if you hover over any of those icons, they'll tell you what they are. But I ran the uh, accessibility checklist, and it shows you exactly what any problems are, and it gives you an option for it to fix them. So I think that is really going to be helpful for all of us. The last topic is copyright. Uh, this is another issue that is really confusing. It used to be years ago when you were teaching face-to-face -face classroom that you know you could use just about anything in your, your classroom. But things have changed with the advent of online instruction. The rules have changed a little bit. And so this is just to make you aware of what you can and cannot do. We do encourage you to link out to things if possible, rather than bringing them into your course. Like if you want to use some documents from the web, or you want to use a website, it's always safer to link out to them than it is to bring them into your course. Plus, it will eliminate some of those things you may have heard about that happened with the migration to uh, SAS, where we had all these orphan and PPG files and stuff like that. It will help us with that as well. So if you have any questions about any of these topics, let us know. If you have any recommendations for other topics that you would like to have included, let us know. Do you have any questions? Okay, then. I'm not sure that's good or bad, but thank you. <laughs>
and BioCite ID. So for nine years now, we have had BioCid ID. In the beginning, a lot of us tested it, tested it out, we piloted the program, and then after about a year and a half, two years, it was fully implemented across campus. And we are, we're then required to have four instances in our classes. So you will hear me talk about instances, and you will also hear me talk about enabling. Um, a few years back, it kind of is the same thing. Today, it means two different things. Everything I'm showing you today, um, Dean Davis, correct me if I am wrong, but I believe that there are screenshots in the um, faculty forum that we're able to, you're able to go in and access. So if anything is going too quick for you and you want to go back and watch it later or you want to open um, one of their um, Word documents will follow the screenshots, you'll be able to do that as well. Um, and just to, because I see some faces that I know are probably going to ask me this question, um, anything that is housed in Blackboard can be, um, you can use your BioCIG ID and BioCite ID. So anything in Blackboard, this can connect to. So I'm going to go ahead and go into one of my spring classes here, and I'm going to turn on my edit mode. So now that we are, or, I'm sorry, turn into student view mode. So now I am in student view. And one thing that is in all of our classes, whether you are brand new to Central Texas College or just brand new to online this semester, this is something that you'll be able to explore and learn more about. So in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see BioSig ID enrollment. You see my mouse hovering over the top of it right now. This is something that is in all of our Blackboard courses, and if it's not, um, the fabulous folks under Dean Davis will be able to help you um, add that to your classes. They have wonderful um, help desk over in her department. So at the top, this is something that most of us are familiar with. Um, at the top, it shows you the BioSig um, ID enrollment. So our students, um, the first time that they take class with us on online class, or even a class that you have on campus that you might use Blackboard in order for them to take a test or a quiz or your lessons, um, they'll be able to see this. They're able to read all about it just as you can. Um, we even have a video um, that Deets has um, put into the courses for us. So students can watch it, you can watch it, and see the process that students go through in order to create this BioCid ID. Basically, it's an authentication process, if you will. So we all give our own password. We could all use the same password, and it's a matter of how we actually draw or click um, that makes it unique to us. Um, we can all use the same one. Mine are three lowercase l's and one capital L. So if that's what you want to use, um, don't do anything too crazy because it is it can be difficult to duplicate if you're trying to draw all smiley faces and frowns and all that. Um, but you go through and you create your BioSig ID. Once our students have created that first time, then any class that they go into, they will use that same password every time. So again, this is just something that's a one-time setup for them. And I'm actually going to show you what it looks like as well. So I'm going to go into my lessons. So what I have done is I have, um, in most of the business classes, are set up similarly. So it's very common for our students in every class they go into. It looks the same. So they go to the lessons, and this is way before they have to take an exam. Um, they're um, going to get used to using their BioSig ID. So they cannot see their lessons until they verify. I don't know how easy it is to see. It looks kind of small from where I am. Um, but basically, it's telling them they have to verify their ID before the lessons will be released. Now, I am freezing, and I'm going to try to do my BioSig ID. It might not work because my hands are a little shaky right now, but I'm going to try really hard. OK, so as you see, I'm clicking on this BioSig verification. Here we go. It may or may not work this time because that does not look like it normally does. Okay, I passed. All right, so now that I've passed that test, all of my lessons have been released. I can go in and I can check them all out. Then when it's time for my students to take the test in the past, they would go through the same process. So this again is that the BioSig ID. Now, what you heard me say an instance versus enabling. I'm gonna go ahead and get out of student mode so that you can see as an instructor what this is going to look like. I'm going to go back to my lessons. All right, now you see at the very top, I have this lessons verification that I've added through the course tools. Again, there are screenshots to show you how to implement and add this part to your class. So this is an instance. From there, every single one of my lessons and everything that I have under this um, page, you can 
can see has an adaptive release right here, enabled adaptive release, meaning that it's all hidden from you until the student completes that biosig ID. So far so good, anybody have a question about any of that? Okay, fantastic. So, in the past, we had the same thing on our exams. So we can go to our exams, which I can't show you because it's not there anymore, but if we were to go into the exams, you would see exam one verification, exam two verification, and so forth. And then I would connect the exam, just as I have connected all of those lessons, to be hidden until the student does their ID, okay? Um, we also have the ability to enable or disable. So now this enabling that I'm talking about, this is where the BioSight ID comes into play. So again, BioSig is that four digit passcode um, that this students will have to put in in order to have something released to them. Now we have BioSight ID, and I'll show you a little bit of what this looks like based on or what I can show you, and then I have to go back to my wonderful PowerPoint presentation um, to where there are actually screenshots that I had to screenshot and even ask um, BioSight for a few screenshots for me so that you can see what that part looks like. But the BioSight is basically um, the closest we can get to a proctoring surface, if you will. So this BioSight ID, basically the student has to have a webcam enabled on their computer. If they do not, there is the ability for them to set it up on their cell phone. So they can use um, their cell phone instead of a computer. The one thing is, and correct me if I'm wrong on this one, D. Davis, um, but they do have to reach out to the BioSight help desk versus our help desk in order to get that set up for their classes. But if they have um, a computer that has a webcam, it's, it's one-stop shop for them. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like now. So I'm going to go back into my student mode here. I'm gonna go down to my exams, which is where they are all housed. I've got my great information there for them on technology. And now you can see that all three exams are here. In the past, you, like I said, you would have seen lesson one, or excuse me, um, exam one verification, exam two verification. Now, you just see the exam. So when I click on exam, because I have BioSight enabled into my classes, as soon as I hit begin, the computer's gonna go through this process with me. So what it's trying to do right now is let me know, um, I'm not gonna read all this to you, but basically BioSight is enabled, but you do have to have a web camera, and I'm gonna go ahead and say proceed, because I wanna show you what happens. So this pops up, BioSight ID is checking out the computer, determining if it is compatible, it's looking for my webcam, and here in just a second, because I don't believe there is one in here, and if I'm wrong, it's gonna tell me in just a second, um, but basically it's about to say, you don't have a webcam. So because of that, then I would have to use my cell phone. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and hit proceed, because it's checking out, let's see what happens. Uh-oh, I can't go on, I've got a violation. Um, I have no webcam detected. So again, this is where I would reach out to the help desk. No problem, they get it set up. I've had two students um, reach out to me, um, and I have been using this program while I was part of the pilot that was in spring of 21, I think. And then, um, close, enough. close enough. And then in October, of course, we were all able to start using this. I've had two students say that they contacted the help desk um, to get their, um, get it set up on their cell phone, and I never heard back from them. I'm like, please let me know how your experience was, let me know, and they took the test and moved on. Of course, they didn't let me know how it went, but it obviously went fine because they were able to take their exam. So if it were able to detect, and I have gone through this process as a student because I wanted to understand what our students experience, okay? So have I been able to do this process, the next thing it would have asked me is for my IOSIG ID. So now there's that, or you know, digit passcode again, my three lowercase L's and my capital L, put that in, and then all of a sudden, I'm released, and I can take my exam. And in this process, the other thing that it's gonna do is ask me to sit in front of the camera, and it's gonna ask me to put my head inside of this, basically this window, so you kinda get your computer just set just right, so you're in the little window, and then you can proceed. And then from there, again, it does record our students taking their exam. It also monitors the noise level. It is a blurred image though, and I'm about to show you what that looks like as well. Um, so that it does protect our students' privacy because that is a growing concern. Students do not want to release themselves, their home, their kids, <laughs> they want privacy. And so this does blur their, the picture of them, but you can still see. So let's get to, we leave this. Just a second. So while I'm 
here, I'm also going to show you what I'm talking about by enable and disable. All right, get back to my lessons. So I'm going to show you what this looks like. So um, on exam one, I'm going to click on the Chevron. And when I click on the Chevron, there's all kinds of options that you are probably very familiar with, editing the test, um, editing the test option, all of those great things. Another thing that is there for us, though, is this BioSig ID options. And in parentheses right now, it says enabled. Y'all see that? So I'm going to go ahead and click on it. And I'm going to show you what it looks like now. It's just going to say that it's disabled. Um, and I've lost it. There it is. So now you can see BioSig ID options disabled. So this is as simple as it is, literally, to turn on BioSig, BioSite, excuse me, ID. I'm going to hit that disable button. And now I'm going to go back and I'm going to click on it again. And now I'm going to see that it is enabled. So during course copy, um, this does get turned off. And so each new course that you teach, you'll go in and you'll enable it. That's it. That's all you have to do in order to turn on BioSite ID. All right? So again, this is enable, disable. This is for the actual recording so that students are recorded. If you do not want to use that part as of right now, it is not required to use BioSite ID. But it is required to use BioSig ID. You have to have at least four instances in your course, um, like on my lessons, that's the instance. In my exams, that's BioSite. Okay? All right, so what happens afterwards? I'm sure you're all wondering. So let's see if I can drive the train back to the presentation here. And let me just scroll down to the what you probably really want to see. All right, so in my course, this uh, is really small, but we all know where submit grades is in Blackboard, right? Um, under those course tools. Okay, so over here, um, under the control panel, you're gonna see course tools right there. As soon as you click on course tools, then that drop down menu is going to pop up, and the one that you're gonna look for is right here, and it says BioSite ID dashboard, okay? So after exams are over, you can go in and look at this dashboard. As soon as you click on the dashboard at the top, again, this is cut off because I you can't see my students and I can't show it to you live, but at the top you will see that my information is there, that there's a filter, that there's a search bar right over here. If I were to scroll down, you would see every single student, every single test would be popped up there. So you see a heat map, um, which is what they call this right here. You see these frowny faces. Frowny faces are bad. You know, that means something you need to check out. Um, you can also click directly on each student that will take you into viewing their recording, okay? So that's something you can do. Or you can scroll back up to the top and click on the filter. So back up here, we're going to filter and search. And pretend I'm scrolling down after that filtering and searching. And then here you're able to kind of get your search parameters like you want. So if you are concerned about seeing more than one face, okay, that is where you would, right here it says, I know it's very hard to see, I apologize. You see two faces. So you're able to say how many faces you want to see. You're able to see if there's an increased audio level, which is down here. So you can kind of get those search parameters around just the things that you are worried about. So high noises, extra faces, people leaving the room, all of those things that we worry about while our students are testing, right? So um, from there, you would hit apply, and then it would only show you the students that have some sort of infraction. Um, so let's look at some infractions, stuff that we want to see, right? What does this really look like? Okay, so this is one student that did have an issue in the course. You can see, uh, kind of, right here it says multiple faces. And it tells you, it looks like there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and more times that the student had multiple faces in the room. So you're able to click on each one of these little blue numbers right here, and it's going to take you directly to where that issue is so that you can see, and we have to realize, you know, if our students are taking tests at home, this is where, of course, you have to try to figure out exactly what this is going to look like for you. Um, but even when I was practicing this, I told my son, do not come in the room. Okay, I am doing something right now. What happened? My son came in the room. Okay, so if he comes in for just a second, would that be something that you would count off on? That's the kind of types of things that you'll have to figure out what that looks like for you. But here you can see, um, in the upper left-hand corner, we have our student. The student has a long hair, blue shirt, hand on the face, right? The one directly below that, no more student. The student's gone. 
So you would be able to sit there and watch the video and say, well, that was only two seconds, okay? During my test, I had to get in the bathroom. So I left for a few minutes and then came back. Okay, so you, you can see that happening. Then you notice the student comes back and what happens? Ooh, there's another person in the room. Well, how long does that person stay? You keep watching the video, and again, these are just screenshots. If you wanted to watch the whole video, right here, you hit play, and you can watch the entire video. You can see how often people come in and out, if they stay, if they have a seat next to them, if they leave, you can see each of those things. So it just kind of takes a minute to focus. Here's another, oops, I went too far. Okay, here is another uh, example. So this has another student with a blue shirt um, in the upper left-hand corner. You can see here that a second face starts to emerge. We're back to just the blue shirt. Now, look what happens over here. We have a totally different person sitting in front of the computer, right? So you can see, even though you don't know what the student looks like, right, you can tell that there's hair, long hair, short hair, blue shirt, kind of a greenish blue shirt. You can totally see the difference in that. You can see the, uh, that second face appearing, that person's kind of creeping in, right? I'm trying to stay away, but just kidding, I'm trying to help too, right? So we can see those different interactions is what BioSig um, calls them. Here are a few other um, scenarios just to kind of see what this might look like. So if, yes ma'am?
have to go in and do that three lowercase l's for me, one capital L, before it then is released, which is unique to me. Yes, sir. One issue, a lot of us here right now have two monitors. You can set the monitors up to show the same thing. So I can set it up where I have one monitor pointed up this way and have my friend over here take the test for me. I'm in front of the monitor with the camera. They slide mouse over me, I do my bio CID, they take the mouse back, and that's all out of the screen. So I'm sitting there staring at the screen the whole time, and they're over here taking my test. So I'm the same person every time. I feel like people find a way sometimes. I, you know, my mind doesn't think that far, but I kind of able to do that.
BioSite, when you do the enabling, um, that enables BioSite to where the student is recorded and have to get in the little frame. And then it also enables at the same time BioSig. So it is two step authentication process. And it counts as a barcode. Yes. 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 Correct.
instructors in general um, will be called upon to play a role in that. Um, we'll be contacting you, asking you to be a part of some of our committees to give your input to make sure that we're moving forward in the right direction and we're doing that together. Um, reaffirmation for the institution as a whole. Our 10-year reaffirmation is actually in 2025. Um, some of you most recently were working with us as we did our five years, so I feel like we just did that and already it's 2025 again. Um, but the important thing to know about that is that we have to start now, and actually we've already started. Uh, we can't wait till 2025 to start putting things together and getting ready for this very intense, in-depth assessment review that's gonna happen. Instead, we need to be planning and preparing for that now, which we are doing. Um, and some of you, again, will be called upon to participate in that process as well. Along with that process comes the QEP, the Quality Enhancement Plan. I can already hear some of you moaning and groaning. I see Julia over here still suffering from PTSD from the last fast project. Um, so a new project is on the horizon. You will be called to participate in that as well, to give your input to help us decide what we want to do as our Quality Enhancement Plan. And again, it is faculty driven. I cannot say that enough, how important it is for you to all have a role in that and to be a part of that. Um, that's becoming even more important because our, our creditors are emphasizing that more than ever, that we have to not only say our faculty is involved, we need to demonstrate that our faculty is involved, so that you have a say and have a voice. Um, and so that's kind of one of my New Year's resolutions along with giving up wine until Easter, which <laughs> it's been a tough couple of weeks. <laughs> you know, you get used to just kind of going home, this long day, pick off the shoes, part of that, and I can't do that now. So I'm thinking, wow, I'm thinking about it more than ever now. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm processed, I'm processed. Anyway, anyway I digress. So my, <laughs> my other goal is to make sure that I am effectively and actively reaching out to you, engaging with you, getting your input, getting your support, um, and making sure that we're, we're moving all of the things that we need to move forward and we're doing that together. Um, there are some new curriculum processes that are coming up. So those of you who are involved in the curriculum process in terms of creating a new program, deleting courses, adding courses, updating your programs, changing credit hours, all those types of things, that process is going to change a little bit. Right now, we have a manual process in place. You know that you use a craft form. You go online. You say, I'd like to change these credits or delete this course or add this course. That's not going to change, but where and how you do it is going to change. And the great news is this is going to be done in a more effective way through a new system that we we recently purchased through Watermark. Um, it's the curriculum management system. The great thing about the system is that along with it comes a smart catalog. So our catalog will now be digitized which will be amazing. <laughs> and so it'll be interactive, you'll be able to search it more frequently, it will be able to be updated um, in a more timely and effective manner. And so we're already in the process of implementing that and we will ask some of you at some point to serve as early adopters to maybe test it out with us, to take a look at it and see how it's working and give us your input and support on that as well. Um, you're already very aware that we changed our IE processes in terms of how we are collecting and gathering that data. Um, we had a little bit of a setback, obviously due to COVID, there were a lot of other changes, and but we're still working on that process. We are no longer using task stream. Yay! Yay. Woo! You're um, those of you who don't know why they're clapping, don't ask. Just trust, <laughs> trust the process. So. Um, we kind of dialed back some things on how we're doing that, but we are, that is still an ongoing process. You should still be looking at your student learning outcomes. You should still be conducting assessments and gathering data and information. We will be gathering and capturing that from you going forward. Um, and the new process and the new way we're gonna do this, hopefully is gonna be easier because you won't have to spend so much time trying to figure out how to navigate the task stream system rather than actually focusing on what it is you want to be focusing on, which is improving your programs and tracking and assessing how well you're doing. So we're moving that forward as well. Um, there's a ton of other stuff, but it's not as, you know, not as serious as you see or exciting, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just surprise you with it later on. Um, <laughs> in the meantime, I wanted to introduce you to some new folks. You know, I've been lucky um, and blessed, really, because um, since I've been in this position, I've had some really fabulous, amazing people working for me um, and working with you, and you all know that you work with them pretty closely. Um, and so just recently, um, over the last year, we lost Dr. Jennifer Cameron and Felicia Robinson. And when I say lost, they didn't win, you know. They just went to another place. <laughs> Not, you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> They moved on, or, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they suck, forget it, but they left. Forget it, they're gone. They're no longer here, but they were amazing, and I kept thinking, oh man, can I do it again? So, you know, it was a lot of, 
confidence, like, oh yeah, I got this. And then there's a whole lot of please, God, please, 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 please. And my prayers were answered because I have two new, fabulous, amazing, dedicated, committed, energetic, and enthusiastic people, which is a good thing, because you know they always come in with that fresh energy before we split out on them. So, <laughs> so right now they're still fresh and new and shiny, and so I'm going to introduce them to you and give them an opportunity to tell you a little bit about themselves. Of what they're working on, and then we're going to get out of the hair. So first up, we have Jeanette Campbell. She's our new director of instructional program support services. Um, well, honestly, I'm not working on much of a training. Um, I'll be happy to work with everybody once I learn everything that I have. She just brought me in. And she sent me emails. She's like, "You're into this. Go ahead, do the research." I'm like, well, done. Okay.
all the departments and all the groups so that we can start to get you moving forward in some of the different processes and things that we're working on. Um, I'm glad to see so many people back. It's been a while since we've kind of been in a room together and seen some faces. So those of you here and those of you online, I hope everybody's being safe and had a really wonderful, amazing, blessed holiday and have some really good New Year's resolutions that you're about to break. Um, and looking forward to an exciting and prosperous year. Um, you can contact us whether you're looking for uh, Marie, Dr. Linden, or you're looking for uh, Jeanette. If you're looking for me, don't call. But these two can be found at extension 1154. <laughs> and most of you have my cell phone, so you know where to find me anyway. Dr. Garrett's got a weird ID that same thing that she throws up that I got to answer to anyway. So um, you'll be able to find us at any time. Enjoy the rest of the in service, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Institutional Accountability and Curriculum Support. Our next topic will cover student resources, what is shop worn, what's new and shiny. Our speakers are the Associate Dean of Enrollment Services, Ms. Eva Hutchins. Uh, the Dean of Student Success and Persistence, Ms. Julie Starkey, and our Loan Officer of Financial Aid, Ms. Lisette Retz.
copies of some things we're going to give you. We are going to also send this all of this stuff out as a PDF, so I will be sending it out to all of you. We'll also get a, a, a PDF copy. Let me just tell you what you're getting. Information about our Academic Studio tutoring. There's a QR code that you can pass out to students. You can request some of these. They can click it. It gets them straight to Academic Studio and how to schedule. We do online tutoring. We do face-to-face -face tutoring. You can do walk-in. You can do appointment. We also do tutoring around uh, study study techniques, uh, uh, time management. We also do work uh, group study stuff. So that's that's all of that in your packet. There's also a little very small flyer about our welcome week activity so that you know what it is and what's happening. So that is provided for you. Big thing. There's also a packet of our uh, Perkins programs. Uh, we do child care assistance, which most of you are familiar with that one. We do uh, textbook lending, which most of you are uh, aware of that one. Also with our textbook lending, a new thing this year is if they are in an e, if they have an e-book or a code of some sort, they can also check out a, um, a, a tablet for it from us as well. That is a new part of that program that's available. The big one I want to talk to you guys about is uh, we now offer transportation vouchers through the academic studio for a student who might need assistance getting around town getting to campus the only thing is they have to at least be in one face-to-face um, -face class obviously in order to qualify for it um, it's the same all of our programs you have to be in a CTE or an um, AAS program you have to have a financial need and all of that that all of those are detailed and the last thing that I'm, I provided you this actually came out of the FAST program and we just maintained it because this to all faculty, but we also send this to all students. This is our faculty resource guide. I mean, our resource guide that we do is both campus and community resources. We try to keep track of the different resources that are available that we can refer students to, i.e. homeless shelters, i.e. food banks, um, and different things like that where they can get tax help. Some of them are uh, virtual resources that are through the website. Some of them are local, but we can try to keep track of some of those things, and that's what's provided to you. Um, and so it's just a list of where you can refer students. If you have a great resource, particularly community-based, you can use it, you can let us know because we connect with all of those uh, every semester to keep all that up to date. Okay? And again, I'm going to send all of this back out to you so that you also have a PDF form. Yes? Academic Studio also does TSI. Yes. Tutoring. tutoring for reading and writing. They do not have to be a student. And if they want TSI math tutoring, they need to come to Math Express and they do not have to be a student. Correct. So you can forward a student who's not yet a student with us and we will work with them on all of that. And or if it's math, we will refer them to Ellen. We of course can help with the math, but we let Ellen's area do the TSI prep on that one. Okay. Can I just say one thing? If you guys have some great students in your classroom, I am in desperate need of tutors right now. I am. I am I'm, I'm, I'm out of eight tutors. It, I have a, they are a robust group. They are amazing what they can do. I'm only carry 20. So if you guys have some students that are great in your content area, can you encourage them to apply? Um, I know the pandemic has really created some, I don't know if people just are trying to look for jobs that we, we really need it. We're, we're doing great. We're, we're meeting the need. But please, help us. Awesome.
employees are also eligible to start to like to know that. So um, the other issues that's going on right now is when students are panicking because of the uh, FAFSA. They always have two of them out at the same time at the U.S. Department of Education. So a lot of students are going to be kind of anxious because they've done the 22-23 year for the next academic year. And uh, we can still take care of them. Just send them to us and uh, we can make sure that they have some kind of uh, assistance, especially with this ARP grant. <coughs> Does anybody have any questions about financial aid? Yes, ma'am. Is the ARP retroactive to fall they can apply in the fall? We are allowing students to continue to apply for the fall if they took at least three hours up until January 24th. That's going to be the cutoff that we're trying to do. So if you have students and they were here last term, we um, are also issuing it for that. There's no more Carissa, by the way. That was the grant previously. Those have all been um, spent. So we're trying to make sure all the millions of dollars that we were blessed with get into the right hands. Anything else? Any questions about financial aid? Um, so 
So generally when we report and we compare with other institutions, we use that master's scale and master's with uh, 20 students. And so right now we're paying $2,000 for those courses. So which is, is up you know, considerably from you know, what it was in the past. So uh, any questions about that so far? Okay. Okay, so for all, there was a large number of full-timers. I just want to spend a little bit of time of reminding you of that comprehensive <coughs> benefit package. I don't know if you were like me when you started going, like, whoa, this stuff is really confusing. I don't understand all these state benefits and what is this pension plan? I, don't, I couldn't even absorb that for months on end. But hopefully you have embraced that and understand what the pension plan is, but I'll go over some of that and remind you of some of those benefits. Um, for all of you full-time employees, you are eligible for what I call state benefits. And that's the uh, plan that is administered for all state agencies. Somehow community colleges were included in that umbrella and we're very fortunate because from what I'm saying, I, don't, I have not found a benefits program that uh, exceeds ours in the area is very comprehensive, especially for what employees have to pay. Um, then we've got the, oh, let me jump back to the health insurance. Uh, the, and you, you probably don't know this, and a lot of times you get those statements in the mail, but the health insurance, if you've got employee-only coverage, and that's the coverage that the institution pays 100% for, that coverage costs the institution over $600 a month. And then as we go on this, let me like yeah. For a few of you that have employee and family, CTC per month is paying $1,200 on your behalf for that coverage. So if you multiply that number times 12, we're talking significant dollars that you don't pay, the institution pays, and then you get this very comprehensive benefit uh, health insurance. You know, we recently changed that. Hopefully everybody that has health insurance knows that we no longer have Scott and White. Uh, that is to change to Blue Cross Blue Shield. We've had a couple little um, challenges with that. But the plans themselves, when you looked at Scott and White and Blue Cross Blue Shield, the plans are exactly the same, like the benefits. It's just the administrators Difference. So there's been some challenges and uh, uh, the requirement with Blue Cross, make sure everybody knows, if you go to a specialist, you have to have a referral from your primary. Everybody know that? That's probably been the biggest challenge. I know for me, it's just the transition. But remember, uh, you won't get in-network benefits if you don't get that referral. So that's, that can be a challenge. Uh, but there's lots of optional coverages. You know, we've got vision. We have dental, life insurance, short and long-term disability. Those, if you don't already have them today, you'd have to sign up during open enrollment, which is generally around the summer. Okay. A great benefit package. The other thing that probably not many of you are aware of is that college provides additional life insurance for all of our full-time employees. Um, it is one times your annual salary, available to you while you work. Hopefully no employees need that uh, benefit, the life insurance. Very sadly, I had one of my employees in human resources that passed away not too long ago um, uh, due to COVID. Um, and so she was able to use that benefit. Uh, her family received that benefit. And it was, it, was, it, it came to light uh, that benefit because as I said it was one of my employees her family got one times her annual salary uh, just know that that is something that you may keep a note in your uh, in your files for your family members but um, like I said no more we're not having any more of our employees uh, utilize that the benefit then we've got these these acronyms. Hopefully some of you know what TRS and ORP stands for. TRS is the Teachers Retirement System in Texas. 
Um, that is the retirement system that we provide full-time full employees just like the ISDs. They offer TRS retirement to their employees. Uh, full-time faculty also, whenever you were hired, you were given the option to go TRS or ORP. And ORP is the optional retirement plan. Uh, there are different plans, but there are retirement benefits, uh, different requirements for when you retire. Um, so any can I have a show of hands? How many people? Well, never mind. That's never mind. We're not going there. <laughs> um, what I would like to go ahead and do is dive in a little bit on retirement. Um, I, a few of you may be considering it, thinking about it. Um, you need to know for TRS, for those of you that are TRS retirees, you're contributing to TRS. Um, you know the requirement is you've got to meet the rule of 80 and to get the health insurance that you have through, you know, the Blue Cross Blue Shield, you've got to have at least 10 years contributing to the health insurance, okay? Or, and there's some other options, but generally speaking, you've got to have what we call the rule of 80, which is your years of service and your age have to equal at least 80 for you to be eligible to retire, okay? Is everybody pretty clear on, okay. Um, with TRS, they, uh, they have really complicated the life of human resources. And you've probably heard some of the, our woes you, about the restrictions for adjuncts, and a lot of that was because of restrictions from TRS and reporting and uh, kind of a mess. Uh, but TRS has put out information. If you're interested in retiring, Okay, listen up, TRS potential retirees. <laughs> they want to hear from you 10 to 12 months prior to your retirement date. They want you to request that retirement estimate. Okay? Then six months prior to your you know, anticipated retirement, they want you to apply for retirement. Okay? Then 60 days before retirement, okay? Then you have to submit the form to HR that we complete that you know, says, okay, you're eligible, uh, they're full time, and then that form you know, verifies your salary and it goes to TRS. They, we no longer um, have the flexibility of somebody coming in you know, today and saying, hey, you know, I just decided January 31st, I'm going to retire. Well, I can tell you, you will not get a pension, a annuity payment, nor will you get your health insurance. You will have a break, you'll have a delay. Uh, because um, I was telling somebody earlier, we can actually see in TRS when they pick up forms, you know, we submit forms, of course, we do things electronically. And we can see when they pick up a form on a retirement application. And my benefits manager was telling me just yesterday, you know, there's forms that sit out there for four weeks. So just make sure, you know, uh, those, you know, probably at least six months you need to start the process. But really, you can stick with their deadlines of, you know, almost a year out, get your estimate six months prior submit your application i think that's very important and then two months prior let hr know so we can start our forms to finalize that process because what you really want is say you retire january 31st you want to know you want a peace of mind that you're getting you know a payment uh in february and that you're not going to have a break in your health insurance so in regards to your health insurance um, of course, there's another state agency that manages that, and that state agency has asked that um, between 30 and 60 days is when you submit that paperwork saying, I'm going to retire. They can move, that's the employee's retirement system, ERS. <coughs> so we have TRS and ERS. ERS wants to know so then they can process your transition from an active employee to a retired employee. 
and then basically your retirement benefits for health insurance would be very similar to what you have as an active employee. Uh, but there's, you need to go through, go through that process and finalize that. Okay. So those are the key things. If you have optional retirement, um, doesn't have near the restrictions, because as you know, it's a defined contribution plan. So you put money in, the college puts a uh, portion in, and then you manage those assets and those contributions. Uh, so you can retire quicker with that plan. Um, and then you said, you talk to your financial advisor and you decide how you want your money dispersed. You still need to let the employee's retirement system know that you, if you're eligible, that you want to keep your health insurance. And remember, to keep the health insurance, how long do you have to work? That's a full time. Ten, ten, ten years. Thank you. That's the key. Um, and, and we can, employee benefits can help you, you know, we can look at your records. Because sometimes, um, you know, on occasion, we have employees leave. I don't, I don't know why they would ever do that. But uh, they leave, and then oftentimes they find their way back. So sometimes we have those instances where we've got employees that have those breaks in service. So if you happen to be one of those, we can uh, look at your record and help you determine exactly how many years of service you've got for retirement and for benefits. Then the, any questions so far? TRS, ORP? Yes. So how, because I've worked as an adjunct faculty for 13 years, how many, how many of those years will go into well, that's where, uh, as a regular adjunct, you didn't contribute to TRS or ORP, so sadly none of those years would count. If you were in that, you know, that weird designation we have, and we have a few left that are the adjunct twos, um, those individuals contribute to TRS, so those years count. Um, but we, we have very few. Uh, of those that type category anymore. Um, but actually, your question is a perfect segue to uh, this, these next, this next abbreviation, QPP, that's the Qualified Pension Plan. And that's the program that is very unique to uh, community colleges. Not very many community colleges have this pension plan. For full-time employees, we contribute, you contribute 6%. But then the college contributes 7%. And that all goes into this account uh, that's managed by TIAA. So hopefully you're receiving your full time and you've been here at least a year because you're not eligible for QPP. You're not eligible for QPP until you've been here a full year. You're getting those TIAA statements. Um, and then we've had some ups and downs, but uh, you know, hopefully got a pretty robust statement that you're receiving. Uh, Part-time employees do receive uh, pension benefits. It's called SPP, Supplemental Pension Plan, but it's a plan for adjuncts. The adjunct contributes 3.75 and the college contributes an equal amount of 3.75. So a lot of times employees refer to their pension plan as their TIAA account, and that's fine. Uh, sometimes the plan is a little hard to explain to employees that have never had a pension plan before. So in HR, one of our benefits, the benefits manager called it a poor savings plan, which is pretty good uh, description because at the end of your separation, you can access those funds. Um, if, you're, if you retire and you're at least age 55, there's no tax consequences. Um, if you separate and you can access those funds, there are some tax consequences with those. But we can give you more information. Yes, Angel CP, is that automatic for our adjunct? Uh -huh. It's automatic, yeah. yeah. And just like the QPP is automatic after you've been here full time for one year. So a lot of times for you know, your full time faculty, you start in September, well then the next September, you're like, I actually, I got a little bit of a pay cut because 
giving you 7% more on top of that. Uh, and, 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 and some of your new employees ask those questions. Uh, that's how that system works. Um, some of, any questions about the pension plan? It's TIAA, you should definitely go out. Um, if you're getting a paper statement, uh, obviously those would come to you in the mail, but a lot of you probably have online accounts. Uh, you should go out there and check those, check out your statements. We do have quarterly pension meetings, and we have very few people that attend those pension meetings, um, and it may be because our pension plan is doing so well, uh, but because each of you can manage it however you see fit, but those pension meetings are very informative. So uh, you will see those invites on Newslink. Uh, I encourage you to attend one of those meetings. Uh, okay. Then we've got some leave. You probably know you, uh, full-time faculty, sadly, adjuncts, uh, the, these leave benefits do not apply to you. Uh, but for full-time faculty, you've got sick, bereavement leave. We have voting leave. Uh, we really encourage employees to go vote, so you can take the time off to go do that. And then you may not know about the parent educational activities and graduation leave. This is something that the state of Texas actually mandated and it's leave that allows you to take time off from work to go and attend, you know, well, your graduation, uh, your kids' graduation, or then even activities that your children have. Um, and it even includes sports activities. So if, say, your son or daughter had a uh, basketball tournament in the middle of the day, uh, you could take, you could use this leave to take that time off. Um, I'll let the dean address and the department chairs address how those uh, classes will be covered. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that's, that's kind of another issue. Uh, but that is something that's available to you. Uh, oh, I have a question. Uh -huh. What's that? Donating blood. I've had previous employees that offer um, paid time off. Oh, yeah. For faculty, we don't have any paid time off. If there's, when we do, when we deal with uh, leave donations, if that has to be a, uh, a medical situation, family medical leave, you know, you heard us talk about that, family medical leave, um, and we can, staff members can donate, can convert their vacation to, to you, to sick leave, and uh, can do the donation. But, it's a little difficult because full-time faculty don't receive vacation. Uh, staff members do. Okay, so I had to start off this next screen and remind you of the 29 paid holidays. So uh, the only month now that we do not have a paid holiday is August. So, okay, we've got one just uh, in less than a week on Monday. It's a holiday in February. We added, uh, recently we added Juneteenth. That was the newest holiday. So, I mean, yes. Ms. Holly, this should be our birthday. We should have, we, we join um, in August as we are. I know, I mean, I'm rich. So, uh, we've got lots of holidays. And thankfully, since, uh, since I've been here, we been able to add a few along the way. So, um, proud of that. Then, for full-time faculty, you may not know this, but there are some legal and professional services that are available to you. The, the caveat to this, it's in relation to your job. So, on your employment contract, it actually mentions that legal and professional services are available to you. So, if there happens to be some wrinkle, let's say, in your class that ends up being a legal issue um, and you were simply doing your job, then we would provide resources to you um, in regards to legal services. Okay. Um, we, thankfully, we do not uh, require our employees to pay for parking, so you can actually you can pay for parking and get one of those primo reserve spots if you have any of those in your area. But a lot of times, most of us use, just use the free parking. Educational benefits. This is an area that I've been real pleased to see an increased utilization for. And this is educational benefits, not only for just CTC courses, but for those of you that already have your uh, degrees and advanced degrees, if you <coughs> want to uh, pursue another degree, 
degree, we could help offset some of the expense related to uh, those courses. How many of you have used our educational benefits program? Okay, well, good, good. Um, and it is for, for the majority of you, you would be taking courses at other institutions. And that is a reimbursement. So we'll, depending on, there's different criteria based on how long you've been here. Uh, you have to, uh, for full time, depending, and some, of, some of you that have used this more probably uh, quote me, but then if, if for outside institutions, if you've been with the institution for five years or, or more, you get up to 50% of the tuition up to $500. $500. I'm not really sure that there's a upper level course that costs less than $1,000, but uh, so typically we're making, we're providing reimbursement to you of $500 per course. Um, that is limited to six courses per academic year. And then if you've been here less than five years, the maximum payment is $250. You can go out and check out. Uh, you can go check out our educational benefits program, and as I said, you know it's available to you. Your dependents, if you got dependents, they can take CTC courses at half the cost. Then you can take uh, CTC courses um, at full. We cover the full cost. So. And there are educational benefits for our adjuncts, so it's not just full time. Uh, for an adjunct, you have to have one year full-time equivalent, meaning that you have taught at least 10 courses. That's our criteria. Uh, you've taught 10 courses. Once you've done that, then you're eligible for the part-time educational benefits program. Um, any specific questions you've got, probably you want to talk to uh, Annette Bay. She's the manager of employee benefits. All right, then overload pay, full-time faculty. You know, ever since I've been here, we've had some type of what we call overload pay. And it's not just payment for additional courses that you teach. You know, if you full-time faculty, you have a set load. If, if you're needed uh, and you're willing to teach additional courses, you know, you will always receive the adjunct rate. But then the college has implemented for some time now what we call overload pay. And if it meets that criteria, you get an extra $800 for a course, an additional course uh, that you teach. So, and there's, for a nine month faculty, uh, you can teach up to four of those, what we call overload pay courses. Okay. And then definitely can use the gym and the library for free got to promote both of those. So I, I really think I went over the part-time benefits um, very well. Any questions about benefits, y'all? Okay, remember, we had a couple issues this week with uh, potential retirees, so remember those, those dates. Uh, the other, one of the other things I'd like to mention for full-time faculty, you know, uh, if, you're, if you're a returning faculty, you've got those uh, employment agreements. And one of the things that we ask in that is that if you sadly decide, um, well, obviously if you're going to retire, you've got to let us know. But if you decide to change courses and move to, to, to leave the institution, we ask that you let us know by April 1st. You know, uh, You've probably heard a lot in the news about the, the great resignation, you know, and that has hit CTC too. Uh, we have a number of open full-time positions. Thankfully, that, that number is pretty small, um, but then a, a much larger number for adjuncts. Um, last, I just checked this morning, and we have 57 open adjunct positions. Some of those, I mean, if you don't know your department, some of those you may not have an immediate need, um, but at least, I mean, we have 57 posted this morning. Um, so what we ask is that the 
is that that you help us continue to thrive. You know, if 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 you decide to to retire uh, or to separate, let us know because we want to continue uh, to pursue. It. We want your programs to continue to thrive and so that we've got some type of succession planning or at least begin that succession planning. Uh, we we try to help offset some of the separations with our uh, pay increase. The problem is, at least for our hourly positions, uh, you know, folks can make $15 an hour just right across the street, you know, at fast food, and you know, we're uh, our our starting hourly position makes with the eight percent pay increase makes nine dollars and twenty cents. So I see some of you flinch, and it's like, yeah, um, and that is a, a pay increase. Um, so we're we're really trying. Um, what I tell the supervisors is continue to treat your employees well. Um, continue to support them what they do, uh, I really believe that has a huge impact in our retention of our full and part-time faculty. We've got phenomenal inst instructors, adjunct, part, I mean, full-time. We want to keep you um, and continue, as I said, the great things that each of you are doing. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other Thank you. 